maintaining the records, um, mapping carrier records. So yes. In addition to the, you know, I guess educational or training that you've received in this area, do you have any real life on the job experience doing that type of analysis? Uh, yes, I mean, we, we use uh, communication record analysis on, a, on an almost daily basis, whether it's to, to locate missing persons or recover evidence or, or anything else. We, we use the practical side of it regularly. And how many of your 25 years with TPD, how many of those years have you been doing this type of analysis? I've been in tech, I believe, for the last 14 years. Okay. Have you ever testified in a, in a criminal case with respect to cell phone? Uh, communication records analysis? Yes, I have. Approximately how many times? 65. Okay, at this time, the state tenders the witness, Your Honor. Mr. Bordier. No, Your Honor. All right, you may proceed. Thank you, Judge. So at some point, did you become involved uh, in the investigation of the murder of Daniel Markell? Yes, I did. And in what capacity did you become um, engaged in the investigation? The Technical Operations Unit received a, a number of requests initially. Again, with the variety of things that we do, there was a request for a forensic analysis of cell phones and some initial requests for uh, communication records to get cell phone records for some of the initial people involved in the investigation. So that would have been perhaps like a lead investigator who would reach out to you in tech ops and say, okay, there's some cell phone stuff going on that we need your help with. Sorry. Yes, absolutely. The investigator uh, or someone in the investigative team will contact myself or one of the officers that works with me and then uh, tell us what it is that they need. Hey, we have a phone that we're going to need examined or here's a phone number. We need to get some records for this. Um, so they give us the request. They tell us what it is that we need and we help facilitate that. Throughout the course of TPD's investigation, I mean, were you intimately involved in that investigation? I was, yes. Did y'all develop certain individuals who were of interest or who were subjects uh, in this criminal case? Yes, we did. Okay, and who were those individuals? Uh, well, uh, obviously, uh, the Adelson family being Charlie Adelson, um, the mother, Donna, and father, Harvey, um, were identified just as family members of uh, Wendy Adelson, the ex-wife. Um, obviously, Mr. Garcia and Ms. McVanawal were developed um, as suspects in the case. Uh, Mr. Rivera was developed as a suspect as well. Okay. And did you develop in the investigation phone numbers believed to be associated with each of these subjects uh, that you just identified? Yes, we did. Okay. May I approach, Your Honor? You may. I'm going to show you what I've marked for identification purposes as states and moms here at TV. Can you see all of it? I can, yes. Okay, and do you recognize the photograph names and phone numbers depicted on each of these large charts? I do. Are the uh, phone numbers and names and photographs with each line on here accurate? They are. Your Honor, I ask to publish this to the jury for my You may. And may I speak about the enforcement of this testimony? The direct examination, yes. What's that? Can we go to the other side? Um, Maybe we should just put them in the side. Let's, let's just move it around. Okay. What are we doing, Ms. Miller? I'm just trying to get a position where I'm not covering the projector, Your Honor. Half your jurors are not able to see it. Yes, sir. If we could go through, if you could go through uh, what the phone number associated with Harvey Adelson why don't, was. Why don't you do this? Why don't you put the up poster here? up over here where everybody can see it? Yes,
you mentioned that sometimes um, you'd be requested to get phone records associated with certain cell phone numbers. <clears throat> That's correct, yes. And you did that in this case? I did, yes. May I approach on this? recognize that? I do, yes. And are those the phone records for Lewis Rivera's cell phone number? 305-570-8153? They are. Next, I'm going to show you State's Exhibit 129. Do you also recognize that disc? I do. And what does that contain? These are the phone records for Mr. Garcia's cell phone number of 786-372-5986. Next, I'm showing you State's Exhibit 131. Do you recognize that disc? I do. And how do you recognize that? Uh, I recognize it by my initials that are on the disc. And what does it contain? It contains the cell phone records for uh, Wendy Adelson. And is that the phone number 954-803-0079? That's correct. Now I'm showing you State's Exhibit 131. Who is that for? I'm sorry. Wendy Adelson. I'm now showing you State's Exhibit 132. Do you recognize that? I do. And what does that contain? These would be the cell phone records for Donna Adelson at the 954-396-0997. I'm showing you State's Exhibit 133. Do you similarly recognize that disc? I do. And what does it contain? The records for Charlie Adelson uh, at the 954 254 I'm now showing you State's Exhibit 134. Do you recognize that CD? I do. And how do you recognize it? Again, by my initials that are on the disc. And what does it contain? It contains the cell phone records for Harvey Adelson at the 954-980-9032. I'm showing you State's Exhibit 135. Do you recognize that disc? I do. And what does it contain? It contains the cell phone records for Ms. McBanawa at the um, 786-564-1312. And finally, I'm showing you State's Exhibit 137. Do you recognize that disc? I do. And what does it contain? These are the cell phone records for Mr. Dan Markell, and his cell phone number was 202-276-8200. Now, Sergeant Corbett, um, each of these discs, I'm going to leave them in front of you for reference. Do they contain a voluminous amount of data? Yes, they do. Hundreds and thousands of pages of data? Yes. For the the various numbers, we obtain various uh, amounts of records, and generally by that I mean time, uh, the time frame for the records. But uh, most of the records are in the hundreds or thousands of pages. If they were to be printed out, there is a a significant amount of, of data actually there if you were to try to print it out. And this is the data that you analyzed in preparation for testifying throughout the course of this trial? That's correct. And is it true you'll be called to the stand multiple times throughout the trial by the state? Yes. So this first um, direct examination of you, what are you prepared to talk about? The uh, Initially here we're going to speak about uh, Wendy Adelson's activity for the day of the homicide and also some of the initial investigative steps that we took uh, in an attempt to develop suspect phone numbers or suspects. Okay, I'm preparing to testify today. Have you prepared like a visual or demonstrative aid to assist the jury in understanding some of the records that you reviewed and uh, the conclusions that you reached in this case? Yes, I have. And would that help you testify? It would. Okay, Your Honor, at this time, I'd ask permission to use the visual demonstration. You may. Sidebar with the tech is being set up. With what? If we could approach sidebar.
Sergeant Corbett, I first want to talk about Woody Adelson's <clears throat> excuse me, activities on July 18th of 2014. Are you familiar with her statements about her movements and her activities on that particular date? Yes, I am. And are you familiar with the route that she says that she took from her home uh, throughout going to lunch at Mosaic? Yes, I am. And have you prepared a map showing the route that Wendy Adelson took? Yes, I have. Okay. Can you show that to us, please? I can. Describe what you have on this slide for Ms. Adelson's travel on July 18th, 2014. Well, we know that she left her residence um, on Aqua Ridge Way. She traveled down Centerville Road and uh, in a cut through to get uh, towards the Thomasville Road area, traveled on uh, Truscott Drive uh, until she approached a, a roadblock, was unable to go further. And is that what's indicated with uh, the map at 2116 Truscott Drive? That's correct. And then where did she proceed after encountering the roadblock? So after there, she proceeded back to Centerville Road and then proceeded on to her first destination, which was uh, reportedly the ABC uh, Fine Wine and Spirits there on Thomasville Road. And again, this is just based on her statements of what she did that day. That's correct. Where did she proceed after uh, going to the ABC Wine and Spirits on Thomasville Road? And she traveled uh, to Mosaic, to the restaurant. Did you, and I believe we already went over in the CD in front of you, you uh, State's Exhibit 131, I believe. Uh, those are Wendy Adelson's phone records? I believe 131. We certainly have them here. Okay. Yes, 131. And you analyzed Ms. Adelson's phone records as well? Yes, I did. What kind of information would a phone company provide, for example, as they did in Ms. Adelson's phone records? Well, generally, we obtain uh, subscriber information, maybe, that will tell us who an account is uh, owned by or paid for. Uh, and we get what we call call detail records, or um, they're the general records that um, provide us with the date and time of an event, um, who's calling who, the duration. So from those uh, CDRs, as we call them, we're able to determine, again, um, the, the who's calling who and when. And there's also a section there that gives us some location information for the cell sites that a handset is using. And you reviewed those? I did. Could you tell from Wendy Adelson's phone records whether or not she communicated with or attempted to communicate with Dan Markell on the, mer on the morning uh, that he was killed? Yes, there was attempted communication, yes. And can you tell me more detail about that attempted communication? Yes, there was uh, an outgoing call at 11.42 a.m. from Ms. Adelson to Mr. Markell. That by um, the records indicate that that phone call was not answered and that it was routed to voicemail. Now, by 11.42 a.m., uh, was Mr. Markell already shot? He was, yes. Did you have any other um, evidence in addition to her own statements about her movements the, the day of the murder uh, to put her at a certain location at a certain time? What we had uh, recovered during the investigation was um, a receipt for, or from uh, ABC Liquors that gave us a timestamp. And we can see that that is at 12.49 p.m. on uh, July 18th of 2014. So that gives us at least an approximate time that she would have been at the ABC liquor store. And so based on your analysis of her cell phone records that contain location information for different events, like the calls and texts that she's having, along with the receipt from ABC liquor at 12.49 p.m., um, are you able to ascertain an approximate time frame that she would have encountered the roadblock um, on Truscott Drive? Yes, uh, obviously taking into account the time that it would take to turn around, continue on, get to the actual store, and conduct the transa uh, transaction, then would have had to approach Judge, the... I'm going to object. This is speculative. Overruled. Then, <laughs> again, we can deduce that it would have passed the roadblock somewhere in the 1240, um, 1245, maybe 1235, 1245 range. Once you had narrowed down the, the timing of her encounter of the roadblock, um, were you then able to look and see what, if any, calls or communications she attempted after encountering the roadblock? Yes. And did she attempt in, to call her uh, child's daycare creative preschool? Uh, she did not. Did she attempt to call Daniel Markell? She did not. Did she attempt to call 911 or other emergency uh, phone number? She did not. And based on her records, were you able to ascertain what it appeared she intended to do after that? Uh, yes. And what was that? Uh, that was a lunch date. 
And was that based on call logs, text messages, and voicemails? Yes, that's correct. Sergeant Corbett, how long have you lived in Tallahassee, Florida? Uh, since 1988. Are you familiar with that area uh, where Mosaic used to be at I-10 and Thomasville Road? I am. Are you familiar with whether or not there are any liquor stores in that vicinity? I am, and yes, there are. And which liquor stores are in the vicinity of Mosaic Restaurant back in, back in July 2014? Uh, well, Market Square Liquors uh, was just across uh, the, the shopping center there. Uh, there's a Publix Liquors and another ABC a little further up Thomasville Road. Are any of those three liquor stores closer to Wendy Adelson's residence at Aqua Ridge Road than the one she went to on, to on South Thomasville Road? Yes, they all are. Can you show whether or not you're familiar with a different route she could have taken to be more direct to get to a liquor store? Yes. And is that what we're seeing here um, on this slide? Yes, the purple route is the route that she took. The dotted route would be, um, by the mapping software, what would be the most direct route. And you can see the location of the other liquor stores. So as you mentioned previously, you know, we've just discussed uh, Wendy Adelson's movements. You also indicated you were involved in the development of suspects through the use of technical data or cell phone communication records. Is that right? That's correct. And what kind of tools did you have um, at your disposal in the tech ops unit to try to develop suspects in this case? Um, well, several, but one of the first that um, we considered was what we call a tower dump. What is a tower dump? <laughs> I can switch here, I'll... So, uh, the investigators learned the movements and times... Can we come back? I have no, move on. Move on. Have a seat. Let me ask it this way. The morning of the murder, did you know, based on the evidence that TPD had, what Daniel Markell's movements were prior to being shot in his garage? Yes, I did. And what were those movements? We knew that he had departed his house and traveled to his children's daycare, um, dropping his children off there, and then proceeded on to the premier health and fitness gym, and then back to his residence. And we knew the approximate times um, that he left and arrived at each of those general areas. Did TPD have any reason to believe that Mr. Markell was being followed the morning prior to being shot? Yes, we did. And what was that based on? Uh, that included the video from Premier where we see the, the Prius come into the parking lot just after and leave uh, following as well. So knowing or believing that he was at these different locations, um, we'll strike that. Did you also have approximate time frames for which he was at each of those locations, his home, the preschool, the gym, and back home? Yes, we did. Having that information, was there a tool that law enforcement had available that it could use to try to hone in on who might have been the suspect vehicle following Daniel Markell? Yes. Again, knowing that we had three unique locations and four time frames, and knowing that, uh, again, most people have and utilize cell phones, we know that any cell phone that was in any of those particular locations would likely communicate with a certain number of cell sites immediately around that area. So by obtaining all the records of the events that went through those cell sites from each of the different carriers, then we could try to compare those data sets and see which handsets were near his residence, near the preschool, near Premier, at the same times that Mr. Markell was. That would likely um, result in a, in a suspect phone number for us. When you say cell sites, can you kind of Tell me like I'm a five-year-old what a cell site is. Sure. Um, your cell phone is a, a very elaborate radio, and it communicates with um, cell sites or cell towers to exchange information. And again, we know where those towers are. We know where they're located in town, um, and that helps us, again, to determine that area that we're going to look at. But the, the cell phone, any transaction that it does, be that a voice call, a text message, or a data session, we know it's going to be processed through a cell site or a cell tower. So the idea here was to look for any phone companies who have cell sites or cell towers in these three respective locations 
and get data from them about every single handset that's communicating with their company's towers within the parameters of that circle? Yes, and parameters of the time. We looked at those very narrow time frames. And what phone companies were believed to have cell sites or towers in these three respective locations? We have four here, and that is T-Mobile, AT&T, Verizon, and Sprint. So TPD subpoenaed or got a search warrant for those records from each of the phone companies? Yes, we did. May I approach, Your Honor? May I? I'm showing you a card, and that is a state subpoena at 139. Do you recognize that CD? I do. And how do you recognize it? Again, by my initials on the disk. And what is contained on that disk? The results of the tower dump search warrant from T-Mobile. I'm now going to show you what I've marked for identification as state exhibit 140. Do you recognize that CD? I do. And how do you recognize it? Again, by my initials on the disk. And what does it contain? The search warrant results from AT&T. The search results or search warrant results that you contain from AT&T, do those contain a certificate of authenticity from the phone company that these are, in fact, the tower dump records from the areas and time frames you requested? Yes, they did. All right. At this time, I'd offer into evidence state exhibit 140. Is there an objection? Give me a second, Judge. Not with regards to this testimony, Judge. No objection. 140 will be admitted. I'm now showing you what I marked for identification as state exhibit 141. Do you recognize that CD? Yes, I do. Do you recognize it because you reviewed it and put your signature on the disk? Yes, I did. And what is contained on state 141? These would be the tower dump results from Verizon. And do those as well contain a certificate of authenticity from Verizon attesting that the tower dump records contained therein are accurate and maintain that existence? They do. Your Honor, at this time, I'd offer state exhibit 141. Any objection? Nothing to object. No objection, Judge. Be admitted. Finally, I'm showing you state exhibit 142. Do you recognize that CD in the same way that you recognize the previous CD? I do. And is that, and what does it contain? The same results from Sprint Wireless. Do these results from the tower dump for Sprint also contain a business record certificate of authenticity for the records contained therein? Yes, they do. At this time, the state would offer state exhibit 142. Any objection? No. No objection. Be admitted. Sergeant Corbett, the last couple disks we went over, these are the tower dump results from T-Mobile, Sprint, Verizon, and AT&T. Are they two very voluminous hundreds and thousands of pages of data? They are, again, yes. And did you review them in this case? I did, yes. So how exactly did you use those records once you get the responses from each of the phone companies? What do you do? Well, the response, largely for us, just contains a list of phone numbers that were present in those locations or utilizing those cell sites in the time frame that we requested. As I explained earlier, normally we would look at commonalities in each of those locations and try to filter out a suspect number, but we did not find something that immediately stood out or something that was common to all of those locations. So in summary, you're looking for a phone number that appears during each of those time frames at each of those four, technically it's three locations, but four different time frames that Dan Markell was to see if there's any number that pops up in the results? That's correct, yes. Each location? And you didn't find such a commonality amongst them? We did not, not in all the locations. Does that mean that the suspect phone was not at those particular locations, that it didn't appear in the phone records? No, it just means... Judge, that's also speculation. Overruled. If the handset is not creating events, if it's not placing voice calls or text messages or data sessions at those times when it's near those locations, then we're not going to see it in the records. If it's not doing events, we won't see those events in any records. So no event, meaning call, text... Let's not just repeat the test on each time. Ms. Norris, move on. Yes, sir. Sergeant Corbett, 
So you can't find one with the commonality. So then what do you do with these tower dump records? Uh, eventually, we knew that we had uh, obtained a number of records for those persons involved in our investigation. And so the idea was, well, let's compare all the people that our um, known subjects have communicated with. Let's compare those with the phones that were in the tower dump. And let's see if there's anything common between any of our people and some of the phones that may have been near one or more of the locations. And whose phone numbers did you run against the tower dump? Uh, everything we had at the time. And of course, the investigation progressed over a, over a lengthy period of time. And we continued to gain more and more records as we went. But at the time, we had at least a reasonable number of records for the Adelson family and some other people that were related to the investigation. Can you show the jury the type of data that you get on the disks uh, we just discussed during evidence from a phone company when you request uh, call detail records? Yes. As, as I mentioned earlier, one of the basic pieces of information that we're able to get would be subscriber information. And this is just a sample subscriber sheet. But it gives us some basic information about the account and uh, who may be utilizing, utilizing the phone or paying the bills or uh, those kind of things. So that's, again, one of the most basic pieces we get would be the uh, subscriber information. What other information do you get? I would mentioned before call detail records. These are, again, sample call detail records. And while there appears to be a lot of information in there, really there's about three sections that are most important to us. There's a section that contains uh, the date and time and duration of an event so that we know uh, when an event happens. And again, when I say event, I mean a voice call, a text message, or in some cases, a data session. Sergeant Corbett, can I interrupt you? If you could use that laser pointer up to your right, and just as you're going through, show us uh, like the date and time, for example, on this particular slide that you Yes, again, so here to. would be our date. This would be the time of the event. And we see for these particular records that time is provided in UTC, or Coordinated Universal Time. So we know for some of our records, we have to make a time adjustment to get to our local time here. And then this would be the seizure time, the amount of time that the handset um, seized the network to complete the call. And then this would be the elapsed time, or how long the call actually um, occurred. And in this case, it's 2 minutes and 11 seconds, just as an example. OK. And I'm sorry I interrupted you. If you could then show us um, information you get about who's calling who or who's texting who. Right. The so then the other important piece for us is the phone numbers that are communicating. So we can see the originating number. This will be the person that's making the call or sending the text message. And we have the terminating number, and that will be the person that's receiving it. Um, so that tells us, again, who is communicating with who. So you compared all of the records that you had. I know we just saw a sample from Harvey Adelson's, but you compared all of those records to the tower dumps. And walk me through that process. We did. Um, we have analytical software, which helps us, again, knowing that we have so many thousands of records. Um, we're able to just ask it to show us commonalities. And what we found was there was a cell phone number, the 786-372-5986 that was present in our tower dump that was also present in Harvey Adelson's cell phone records. What does that mean, it was present in his records? Uh, it had, a, there was an event in his records with that phone number. In this case, it happened to be an incoming phone call um, on July 1st. So Harvey Adelson's phone had an incoming call, num call on July 1st from this 786-372-5986. Five nine eight six number, is that right? That's correct. And that phone number ending in five nine eight six was one that we got from the tower dump records we first subpoenaed. That's correct. Okay. So then, what did you do? Well, then we uh, obtained more detailed records for that target number, and that was the number that um, we eventually determined belonged to Mr. Garcia. So we were able to obtain records from T-Mobile for that and then do some basic analysis on that phone number. Can you uh, use phone records provided by the companies to determine what phone number a particular handset communicates with most frequently? Yes, we can. Tell me about how that's done. Again, with the help of some software or spreadsheets, we're able to uh, look at all the incoming outgoing phone calls, determine the unique numbers that a handset communicates with, 
and then also determine the frequency, how often one phone number communicates with another. And that helps us with a lot of things in determining relationships or um, you know, friends, uh, co-conspirators, those kind of things, that who uh, a phone communicates with most frequently is probably someone that's significant to them. And that's called a frequency report? Yes. Did you run a frequency re report, excuse me, on Mr. Sigfredo Garcia's phone records? We did, yes. And what were the results? Well, what we found was the most frequently contacted number was the 786-564-1312 of Ms. Magmanawa. What time frame are we looking at when we ran this frequency report? Well, in this particular one here, you're looking at May into um, July. Again, as the investigation progressed and we obtained more and more records, then those frequencies are going to change because now we're adding more and more phone records into it. But at any particular time, we run, you know, again, this by a fairly large percentage was his most frequent caller. And you said the time frame for this particular frequency report was May to July of what year? 2014. So it's just a three-month period that this is based off of? Yes. Did you cross-reference Catherine McBanawa's phone number, this uh, 786 number ending in 1312, with any of the other records that you had for um, people associated with this case? We did. We found that this phone number was also common to uh, Charlie Adelson's phone. And in a similar frequency report for his cell phone, we see that it's also one of the most frequently contacted numbers. And that's what you're showing us here with yes. the 7% frequency? Yes. yes. Okay. Earlier, you'd shown us the frequency report uh, for Sigfredo Garcia's cell phone records, indicating Ms. McBain was on the top. What about the other numbers that were called frequently? Did you do anything with those numbers? Uh, yes. Again, as the investigation progressed, um, it was decided that we could look at uh, all of the contacts that Mr. Garcia had and compare those again back to the tower dump results to see if anyone that he communicated with frequently also happened to be here in Tallahassee near one of those cell sites near one of our um, interested times. And what were the results from that comparison? What we found here was that the 305-570-8153 of Mr. Rivera is in the top callers of Mr. Garcia's phone and was also present in our tower dump results from AT&T. The phone records you had for Sigfredo Garcia and Luis Rivera from July 18, 2014, did they contain the location information you previously indicated uh, these phone records typically provide? Yes, they did. Were you able to compare the location information for the events they had on their handsets with mo the movements of Daniel Markell on that date? Yes, we were. And what did you find out? Well, again, looking just at those narrow time frames, um, we look in those cell phone records and one of the other sections in there is location information. And these records are T-Mobile, but they provide us a latitude and longitude for the cell site. And this is the location of the actual antenna or tower or structure or whatever it is that this radio equipment is mounted on. They give us that latitude longitude. So we're able to take that information and put it on a map and determine where that cell site is actually located. And we can see here for those two events that cell site is located just north of I-10 and a little west of Thomasville Road there. Did Gar uh, Mr. Garcia or Mr. Rivera have a lot of events around the time of the actual murder? Uh, they did not actually, no. Okay. What about earlier on in the morning? Um, not in the time frames that we're talking about here from where um, Mr. Markell left his residence, there were really very few events for these handsets um, and really most of them center around this particular location right here at Premier Health and Fitness. Can you expound on uh, the two events you have here at 9.36 and 9.58 a.m. Um, near Premier? Yes. So, again, we're provided with that location of where the cell site is, and, and sometimes just knowing where the cell site itself is is all the real information that we need. That tells us enough. If someone says that they're in Miami but they're communicating with a cell site in Tallahassee, 
It really doesn't matter what side of that cell site they're communicating with. I know that they're not anywhere near Miami. But we do know that most of our cell sites are actually broken down into multiple sides or sectors. So they have antennas that are facing in certain directions away from that cell site. We also get that information from the cell carrier. So in addition to the location of the cell site, we know that orientation or the direction that those antennas are facing. And that helps us narrow down the location that a handset could possibly be in for any particular event. The, on this slide, you have orange indicated for the 936 and 958. That indicates Garcia's uh, records? That is correct, yes. Okay. And can you show us um, what particular cell site location was being used with the sectors you just described? Yeah, so this cell site from T-Mobile is, as most are, broken down into three sectors. And we can see that the orange arrows here are pointing in the direction that those antennas face. So we know that that cell site, again, has three sides to it or sectors. We do get information as to which one of those the handset is using. What we know is that if you were to uh, just drive in circles around a, a cell site on your cell phone, your handset is going to transition from one of those sectors to the next to the next as you continue to drive in a circle. The dash lines here represent kind of an approximate area where that might happen. We expect one cell site or one sector to cover about halfway to the other sector and the same thing for the last. So by estimating where that transition is, we kind of get an idea of the, the, the kind of width of that cell site or where, again, the approximate location where that handset could be. In the records themselves, we see that T-Mobile tells us the handset is using the cell site oriented at 40 degrees. And if we look at that on our particular cell site, that's um, emphasized by the large orange arrow. So that is the cell site and sector that the handset was communicating with for that particular event. Is the cell site and sector that uh, Sigfredo Garcia's handset is using for these two events, um, is that consistent with the cell sites that would service people at the Premier Fitness Club? Yes, it is. Did you do the same type of location analysis for uh, Luis Rivera's phone records? Yes, we did. Did he have any events with location information? He did, and these are AT&T records. The information looks a little different, but it's the same basic information. We have the location of the cell site and the sector that's being utilized. We can look at those cell sites and then in further the actual sectors that are being communicated with for those events. So the same thing we just did for Mr. Uh, Garcia. Here in blue, the big arrows represent the, the direction of the sector of the cell site that's being used during the event. That's correct, right. yes. You mentioned that there were two different phone companies. Garcia had T-Mobile, was that correct? That's correct, yes. Um, and Luis Rivera had AT&T records. Um, if you're using a different phone company as your phone provider, you'd be using different towers, is that right? That's correct. Each carrier has its own uh, infrastructure or its own towers. Uh, there are cases where a handset may roam to another carrier, but for us, the four carriers that we mentioned earlier, the AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, and T-Mobile, all have their own equipment. So while two people may be standing in the same place, if they have two different carriers, they could communicate with two very different cell sites, one in one direction, one in another. And it's based upon their particular carrier's cell sites. So based on the location information, are both handsets consistent with using the towers at Premier Gym or Premier Fitness Center yes, in the morning. It, for a handset that was in the parking lot, these are the cell sites and sectors that I would expect that handset to communicate with. Now, can you tell us exactly where on this map a certain handset is precisely? Absolutely not. I'm providing a general area, a general location that the handset could have been in. Our historical cell phone analysis is about including and excluding locations. So I'm asked, is the Premier Health and Fitness, is that address uh, an address that would be serviced by these particular cell sites and sectors? And I look at these and I look at where the adjacent or the next closest cell sites are and you can see they're some distance away. And I would say yes, the Premier Health and Fitness is certainly an address that would be serviced by these particular cell sites and sectors.
is it fair to say that pretty much all of the events that we have right around this time of the murder are consistent with the Premier Fitness Club? That's correct. Let's say that these two handsets had been at Creative Preschool uh, prior to going to Premier Gym, but had had no events. Would that be one, possibly a reason that they didn't show up on that tower dump when we were looking for commonalities? Objection, Judge. Call for speculation. <coughs> Overruled. In looking at the records that we obtained for both of these, we know that there were no events in that time frame. So if there are no events in that time frame, we have no locations um, in which to say where a handset may have been or may not have been. So yes, in, in answer to the question, because there were no events, they did not show up in those tower dump results. If there are no events for a handset for certain t time periods, is that consistent with that handset being powered down or turned off? Objection. Overruled. There are a number of reasons that a, a handset may not have events. You may simply not be using it or doing anything active with it and maybe just not receiving any phone calls or text messages. Your phone could have gone dead. Um, the battery died on it to where it's no longer in communication. You could be so far away from a cell phone tower that you're unreachable to the network. Or yes, one of the, one of the options is that you powered down that handset as well. By the time that TPD had requested these uh, tower dump records from the phone companies and, and performed the analysis you just walked the jury through, um, had Sigfredo Garcia and Luis Rivera been developed as suspects in this case? Yes. And did you do much more extensive analysis of the phone records that uh, we talked about earlier? Yes, we did. And we'll talk about that later, is that right? Yes, we will. I have one moment, Your Honor. Sergeant, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay. I say sergeant because you are a member of law enforcement, correct? That's correct. And as you indicated to the members of the jury, you've been a member of law enforcement for coming on a quarter of a century, correct? Uh, just with TPD, yes. Just with TPD? Yes, sir. What about before that? I was a reserve deputy with the Wakulla County Sheriff's Office starting so in 19. more law enforcement experience behind the 25. That's correct. Okay. How much more? Uh, since 1995. 1995. So my math here is... I'm sorry, 1992. 19, okay. My apologies. It's okay. So 8 plus 19, 27 years? Sounds about right, uh, yes. Sir. And you indicated on direct examination you have testified 65 cases. That's correct. Totally. Yes, sir. How many of those cases have you, ex have you testified on behalf of the state? Uh, in all of those cases. So all 65? That's correct, yes. So that means that you have never testified as a defense expert? While I have uh, helped defense counsel, those cases have never resulted in actual testimony. So the answer to my question is that you have never testified in trial for the defense. Is that correct? That's correct. In addition to all your trial testimony being with the government, you're also married to a prosecutor, isn't that correct? I am, yes. And you're married to a prosecutor that works with the prosecutor sitting right behind you, is that correct? That's correct, yes. So you're at the helm of the demonstrative aid, is that correct, sir? Yes, I am. If you could indulge me. You indicated that there was two, well, let's, let's go to the demonstratives. You'll see the one on the far right side in the middle. It has my client's name on it. Is that correct, sir? It does, yes. And you'll agree with me that to the right of his name in white is a 
telephone number starting with area code 786, correct? Yes. 786-372-5986, correct? Yes, sir. All right, and you'll also agree with me that all the investigation that you've done with regards to any phone number associated with my client, is that number there? Uh, no, sir. Okay. But I only see one number up there. Yes, sir. Okay. The question is, uh, in the initial part of the investigation, this was the cell phone number Mr. Garcia had. As we progressed through the years of the investigation, he had other phone numbers as well, and there was work done on those phone numbers. Do you have those numbers with you? I, I do not have them in front of me, but I could get to them, sir. And were they expired numbers, numbers that he was no longer using? I believe so, yes. Well, I, there was a time where the investigation we were looking at in real time, where we were getting real time information. Obviously, the cell phone that he had at that time was active and live because we were obtaining real time information from it. Some of the other phone numbers that he may have had in the interim were probably no longer functional numbers. What about the, the other phone that he was arrested with in Broward County? Did you do your due diligence on that phone? Uh, yes, sir, we did. So just to be clear, there was a second phone that he was arrested with, correct? Yes, sir, there was. And do you have the information as to when that phone was activated? Uh, not in front of me. I'll sustain this, Judge. Judge, may we come sidebar? I may inquire you on. Okay. So we'll get to that other stuff later. Um, if you can click back to the, uh, yeah, if you wouldn't mind, uh, Sergeant Corbett, you had two phone numbers on the 786 372 5986 number that were, were the basis of the activation of the cell towers, and I believe. That's a call at 9.36 and 46 seconds. I'm Remember sorry. ready to get there. You're speaking of these events? Yes, sir. Yep. Now, the top event, the 9.36 event, yep. that was a seven-second phone call. Is that correct? 
I believe so, yes. We can pull up the full records if we need to. But well, if you need to look at something to refresh your recollection to be able to adequately and properly advise the jury, please to let, do your due diligence. When you're ready, let me know. Uh, I, for the location information, the duration of the event was not relevant. Okay. Well, with all due respect, that's not what I'm asking you. Okay. I'm asking you if it was a seven-second phone call. Okay. Then let me get to the actual records, and yes, I'll sir. tell you more about that event. Yes, sir. The 936 event was for seven seconds. The 958 shows a minute. Okay. Now, the 958 event, I'm sorry, let's, let's start, let's stick with the 936 event. That came from a 786 number, correct? Yes, sir, it did. And correct me if I'm wrong, but law enforcement has the ability, based on the phone number, to try to determine who the person that extended this call is. Is that correct? That's correct. In the 9.58 and 11 seconds, uh, the second, uh, I guess, event on the, the 18th, if you look at the phone records, there are a slew of calls that have the exact duration of one minute. Is that indicative of a text message or is that a phone call? It is indicative of a text message. So at 9.58... I'm sorry, let me clarify. The duration is not indicative of a text message. We do see one minute as the list of duration, but there are other indicators in the records that tells us that that is, in fact, a text message because you could have a voice call that was one minute. Okay. Thank you for clearing that up. So on those two events, one appears, well, we know for sure one is a seven-second phone call, right? The top one, the number that we talked about, 786-317-8493, that's a seven-second phone call, correct, that's Sergeant? Correct. And the second is an incoming text message. That is correct. And the incoming text message, do you have a phone number for that incoming text message? It's a short number, but yes, the 326-65040. see here. 326-65040. Three, two, six, six, five, six, five, zero, four, zero. Zero, four, zero. Those numbers don't add up. They don't. Okay. Is there a return text message to no, that number? There is not. Now, because, well, let, let, let me ask you a quick question about um, Louis Rivera. You have that number right there? That's his number that you have associated with him, correct? That's correct. And have you been <coughs> proactive in this investigation? If the government gets new information and they give it to you, do you do your due diligence? Yes, sir. Okay. And you're aware that Luis Rivera gave a statement on October 4th, 2016, when he began cooperating with the government? I don't recall the exact date, but I do know that he's provided statements. Okay. And... <coughs> He also discussed having multiple phones. You're aware of that? I am, yes. Now, you talked earlier with regards to tower range. Is that correct? Uh, I did not really speak with range. I spoke with an approximate area handset could be, yes. Well. A lot of your testimony was based on the location of a tower, correct? Yes, absolutely. Um, did you ever go and take specific measurements, you yourself, from that tower? No, we did not. Did you have the ability to do that? Uh, we could have secured the ability, yes. But you chose not to? Uh, I'll withdraw that question. Are you able to truly know the true range without measuring. The, you're talking of a particular cell site. Correct. Um, and it depends on what you mean by measuring, but I assume you're talking about a drive test or something to that effect? Well, I mean, you're the expert, okay? I'm not. I'm simply saying that when you go out there, if you have the ability to measure 
or take measurements of a tower to make sure that the information that you're giving to a jury is correct, would you agree that without doing that exact measurement, anything that you tell this jury is a potential, it's a guess? No, I would not say that at all. What I'm speaking about and the evidence that I have is the cell sites that are being communicated with and the orientation of those sectors, and we know which way they're pointing. We look at addresses and we say, could this address have been included or not? And in all of the cases that I have, that determination is easy to make. And they're relatively close to the cell sites and they're where we expect them to be. And um, there's really no need to do anything additional. One of the problems with the drive test is coming back in time. And it would always be argued that if you didn't do it the same day and the same time and the same weather conditions and the same everything as that exact day, then even that's still not exact. And even that has variation to it. So we had the information that we needed to make the determinations that we did. And again, in no way am I saying exactly where a handset is. I'm just giving the general area that that cell site covers. Okay, well, let's do that. Let's give the general area that that cell site covers. Based on your demonstrative aid that we're looking at up here, what other locations fall within that general area? Are there any restaurants in that general area? There are. Okay, which ones? Uh, well, there are a number of restaurants, and let me pull this up here. Not being quite the travel guide. There are a number of restaurants in uh, the shopping center there. There are restaurants. There's well, a, hold, hold on one I'm second. Sorry. I'm trying to answer your question. I, I, I apologize. I'll interrupt if you please. I, I don't Go ahead. Sorry. So there are a number of restaurants uh, within that area. There's uh, from uh, Thomasville and Killarney, the Applebee's, there's a uh, Wendy's, there's all kinds of restaurants in the shopping center across the flyover. Uh, a, a number of restaurants. Okay, well, being the fact that you indicated that you've lived here coming on a few decades, maybe more, let's talk about each specific restaurant. You said that there's an Applebee's? Uh, there is, or at least was, yes. Okay, and there's a Wendy's? There is. Is there a Chick-fil-A? There is, but I do not believe that the Chick-fil-A would be in this particular cell site and sector. Is there a McDonald's? There is, yes. Because right by the residence inn, right? Right across the street from the residence inn? Uh, there's a McDonald's at uh, just north of, t or between Timberlane and, or between Market and McClay Commerce. There's a McDonald's. What other restaurants are there? Well, sure. Uh, there is in the shopping center, I know that there is a Bonefish Grill. There at least used to be, I believe, a Firehouse Subs in there. There may be a sushi restaurant in there. Um, and I'm trying to remember back in 2014, uh, there is a uh, chicken restaurant on Thomasville Road. <coughs> So we've discussed one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight potential restaurants now. There could be more, correct? Yes. Okay. And you'll agree with me that out of those, at least Wendy's and McDonald's and Chick-fil-A serve breakfast. Uh, they do, yes. And the incident or the date of this incident occurred on July 18th, and that's, a, that's not a Sunday. That's a, that's a weekday, correct? That's correct. So is. all three of these stores are open at the time? At least those three? I, I have no personal knowledge that all of those restaurants were open on that date and time, but I have no reason to believe they were not. What other stores or locations are in that general area? Are there any hotels in that general area? There are. Okay. Can you tell the members of the jury which hotels are there? Uh, again... There, and I'm not sure in 2014, there was a Motel 6 right here at Timberlane Road and Thomasville, there is... I'm sorry, sorry, you're talking out of... So you sorry. said a Motel 6? Uh, there was at one time. I'm not sure when that ceased uh, operation, but and, it was there. Okay, and that was on what road, sir? That was uh, Thomasville and Timberlane. Thomasville and Timberlane. Okay, what else, sir? Uh, I'm not aware of other hotels... 
right there. There are some on the southern side of that, which I don't know. There's a, a I believe, a residence in maybe a Hampton Inn, something here that's off of Raymond Deal. Right. I, I'd be happy to bring up Google, and we could we could get more specific if if we need to. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what. I know that the government indicated they're going to call you multiple times, and I'll 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 be more prepared so we can go over that Google map the second time. <laughs> All right, so let me ask you some questions with regards to uh, factors that could potentially imp impact the range of the cell towers. Are there certain factors that could imp impact the range of cell towers? There are, yes. Okay. Um, could you explain to me what a down tilt or a down angle of the antenna is? We're talking about the, um, we talked about each cell site has a set of antennas on it, right, that direct energy out. So the angle that those things are pointed is one thing that we're aware of. And then the down tilt would be if they're pointed down or up because we're, it, we don't want to direct that signal off into the air, right? So the, each uh, cell site has a, an angle that those antennas are mounted at to help control that distribution of that energy. And you'll agree with me that whether or not that there's a down tilt could potentially affect the range of the, of, the, of the tower, correct? It could, yes. Did we know if there was a tilt with regards to the specific tower at, that, at the time of the incident? All the antennas have an angle in which they're mounted. Whether it's up, down, they all have an angle in which they're mounted. Do you know the down angle of the antenna serving Premier? I do not. Can you tell whether a call is made inside or outside the serving area? I'm sorry? Can you tell whether or not a call is made inside the, I assume you, based on the tower, the cell tower, the antenna angles that you have, can you make a determination as to whether or not a cell a, a call is coming from within or outside of that area? I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Let me Where ask the you. call is coming from could be anywhere. If you're speaking about the location of the handset, then again, no, I would not believe that it's outside of that area because if it were outside of that area, it would communicate with a different cell site. Do you know if T-Mobile had done any maintenance to that cell tower or those cell sites? I do not. Is that something that you'd be able to determine if you made the appropriate calls? Uh, sometimes we can and, and sometimes we cannot. Are you familiar with any studies validating the use of cell tower analysis? Uh, yes. Which ones? Uh, specifically the scientific working group. Anything else? I can provide some additional studies and things. Again, not I don't have those with me, but I do have some documents, yes. So the only one, you've been qualified as an expert, 65 cases, sir? Yes, sir. Okay. All 65 for the government, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And in preparation to testify as an expert with regards to the specific issue that we're talking about, which is cell tower analysis, you're indicating that you're only familiar with one publication? Uh, off the top of my head, publication-wise, yes. Okay. The, the two events that you have associated with Sigfredo Garcia, let's, let's talk specifically about the uh, seven-second phone call, because you'll agree with me that an incoming text message doesn't suggest that there's activity, correct? It simply means someone sent you a text, right? That's correct. Okay. You can't tell who picked up Garcia's phone at 9.36 on July 18th, 2014, correct? That's correct. And you can't determine whether or not Mr. Rivera was in possession of Mr. Garcia's phone, correct? That's correct. You'll agree with me that some, a manner in which to confirm who answered the phone would be to provide the information of the caller that made the call, correct? Yes, sir. And I just want to confirm this, that the cell... 
the cell phone records can't put a particular device at a particular location right that is correct so while we could you could you could put up a map a little chart like you have up here a demonstrative and you could send you could put a, a a marking showing what you believe to be the ranges it's simply a guess correct I, I wouldn't call it a guess but let me I rephrase it then sir you can't tell me specifically where mr garcia was the morning of july 18th can you that's correct i cannot no further questions yes your honor as always mine will be real brief To confirm you work with the Tallahassee Police Department, right? I do, yes. You're in the same building as all the investigators and other sergeants that will be testifying in this trial on this case? That's correct. Now, through that and your work in the Technical Operations Unit, you know the working theory of this case, of this prosecution? I do, yes. All right. So if you could bring up the, the frequency slide, whichever one you want to go with first. Please explain to the jury what this is again. Again, with the use of our analytical software, we're able to produce a report that just tells us which phone numbers are communicated with by a particular phone most frequently. It doesn't take into account directionality. They could be all incoming or outgoing or a combination thereof. And they could be both text messages and voice calls or any combination thereof. Who are these communications between? The What people from your boards? Uh, this, the top one is Mr. Garcia's phone number. These are the records for him. And the phone number that's highlighted here is Ms. Magbanawa's. All right. So he communicated with Ms. Magbanawa, and you've got 1,635 times. The, her phone number appears in his records um, with that frequency that many times. Now, when you say communicated, that doesn't necessarily mean they actually spoke 1,649 times. Um, we look at not necessarily the specific number of the records, but the relative frequency. Whether they communicated or tried to communicate, the percentage or the, the volume of records is what we look at. Can we agree they talked a lot? Uh, yes, we can. Right. You don't have the contents of these communications, of these ones? Of these, I do not, no. All right. So, at best, you can say that Catherine McBanwa, my client, communicated with the father of her two children a lot. That's correct. Let's go to the next one, please. Now, what we have here is the communications in between Charles Adelson and Catherine McBanwa, right? That's correct. The same thing applies that this isn't just all phone calls, it's all potential communications, or however you phrased it? That's correct, yes. We can agree that they talked a lot? We can. You don't have the contents of those communications? Um, those specific communications? Let, let me rephrase that question. You don't have recordings of phone calls in between these two for that frequency, do you? No, I do not. All right. So, and again, you know the working theory. At best, you can say that Catherine McBanwa was talking to the guy a lot that she was dating at the time. That's correct. Now, please don't take this as an attack, but technical operations and what you do, it's somewhat limited, right? I'm not sure in what way. Human to human connections, it's limited. Because there's other ways that humans can communicate, right? Uh, yes, there are other ways that humans can communicate. Now let's just stick with electronics. There are certain apps that can be used, like WhatsApp, that you wouldn't necessarily have access to. That's correct. Unless you have the physical phone. That's correct. All right, that's one way. And that's, a tech, that's an electronic thing, that people can communicate that way. It is, yes. Now, people can also have face-to-face -face interactions. There used to be a day when people did that. That's correct. Now, you're, you're in, in, do I call it a science? What would you call it? Uh, I believe it is a science, yes. All right, so your science is limited because it doesn't encompass all of those other potential connections. I, I don't want to say it doesn't encompass. We're aware of when WhatsApp is in use, and we, of course, advise the investigators and attempt any way to be able to get that content, get hands on a, on a particular uh, handset so that we can get that communication. So we're very much aware that those other methods of communication, such as iMessage or anything else, can be used. And so we try to let the investigators know, hey, this is something that you need to be aware of and work towards. So it's more a limitation of what the provider, the phone company, and the app um, producers are able to provide for us 
than it is a limitation of, of ours. But you agree with me it's limited with respect of all of the different ways that humans can communicate? It is limited, yes. For instance, you wouldn't know the potential connections in between Sigfredo Garcia and Charles Adelson, right? I only know what I have or don't have in the records that I have. So outside of anything electronic, you just wouldn't know? That's correct. For instance, if Luis Rivera has a connection to Charles Adelson, you wouldn't know that either, would you? If it's not in the records that I have. Sigfredo Garcia to Harvey Adelson, you wouldn't know that? That's correct. And these are all possible connections that don't include Catherine McBannell? That's correct. One second, Your Honor. Sergeant, just to clarify something that the, the state attorney's office asked you, and it has to do with the communications in between Wendy Adelson and Dan Markell. It was at the beginning of your direct examination, you talked about a phone call that was placed by Wendy Adelson to Dan Markell? Yes. Isn't it true that she was returning a phone call that he had placed to her earlier that morning? Yes, he had called her earlier that morning. Just wanted to clear it up. Thank you. Redirect. Without going into great detail, um, Mr. DeCoste asked you some questions about what your information is limited to. Do you also have access to all the other data that the Tallahassee Police Department was gathering against Sigfredo Garcia and Catherine McBanwa in this case in analyzing the phone records? Um, I have access to a lot of it, and I'm not sure exactly what you're asking about, but um, my part of the investigation deals primarily with the electronics and the forensics that, that were conducted. Investigators were doing interviews and talking to people and gathering other types of evidence and all kinds of things, and I'm certainly not aware of every single thing that they had or collected or knew in the case. I know about what we communicated about. But you did communica communicate excuse me, about relevant things outside of just the vacuum of these phone records. That's correct, yes. And Mr. Zeng, can I ask you some questions about um, the map with the towers? If you could go back to that for me, uh, showing Premier. Okay. How many cell sites or towers are there in Tallahassee? Uh, there are a number of cell sites, hundreds, between all the carriers. And were you able to narrow down the number of towers around the Premier Gym area? Yes, we were. Okay, and approximately, are, we, are, are you showing me all those towers? Yes, these will be the towers from 2014 uh, for T-Mobile, just the one carrier. So in, in determining that general area, approximate area handset could be in, we certainly are aware of where those other cell sites are because we know that you know, generally that effective range is going to be affected by where the other towers are. So we, we are aware of those, yes. Could you zoom in just a little bit on the flag um, of Premier Gym and Fitness? Mm -hmm. And how many towers nearby that area can you see there for T-Mobile? Uh, right Kirsten? here, there's only one additional one, and that would be, and I'm sorry, I'll use the laser. That would be the cell site here. So would you expect if someone has a handset at Premier Health and Fitness that they would be communicating with one of those two T-Mobile towers? Yes, I do. Out of all the hundreds, Mr. Garcia's was communicating with that one right by Premier. That's correct. Thank you, Sergeant. I'm going to take your question. All right, Jerry, I have a question. Go side part.
one follow-up question from the jury sergeant. Um, can other uh, items that a phone is being used uh, for cause it to come in contact with the tower besides phone calls or text messages? And I think the juror said, for instance, if they're using the internet, is it going to uh, show up with this type of uh, entry? Yes, sir. The, um, yes, in some cases, I'm, I'm sorry, is the, is the answer here. The, I talked about one of the possible events being a data session in addition to the voice or text message. While, yes, the phone making or having an established data session, which would be necessary for Facebook or surfing the web or any of those kind of things, unfortunately, we don't get that information from all the carriers. We do see data activity with AT&T, but we do not see it, for instance, with T-Mobile. So while, yes, those do um, cause contact with the tower, we're not always able to see that information. Ms. Doris, any follow-up? No, Your Honor. Garcia? I'll reserve. Okay. McBain, what? Any follow-up on this? No, Your Honor. All right. You can step down, remain under the rule. You'll be subject to recall. Can we take 15 minutes? Either side need anything? No, Your Honor. No. All right. We'll be in recess 15 minutes.
Get an issue, Mr. Kaplan. Just wanted to bring to the court's attention that the next witness is going to be Mr. Rivera. I anticipate that he will be a lengthy witness. I'm particularly anticipating a lengthy cross. But that being said, this is the last witness that I have brought for the day, and I don't want to be in a posture where I run out. So I was looking for a little guidance from the court. Would it be okay if we end with him today, even if it's a little earlier? Or would your preference be that I get some more folks up here? I don't have any doubt that he's going to at least take up the rest of the day. Okay. I think so, too. Don't need any other witnesses. I didn't want to get in trouble. Is that all? That's it. Your Honor, before Mr. Rivera testifies, if I could make just some legal objections that I don't want to have to do in the presence of the jury. You may. The first objection that I'm going to have at this time is that it's our position that the state, even taking in the light most evidence to them, has failed to establish it by a preponderance of evidence of conspiracy that involves Ms. McDonald, so that at this point we would say that any co-conspirator hearsay statements should not be admissible because the court is, I'm sure the court is aware that the contents of the statements cannot be used in determining if there is a conspiracy, and at this point it would be our position that they have failed to do so. That's our first objection, Your Honor. Do you want to move before I move on to the second? Yes. Okay. What? Oh, I'm sorry. Do you want me to wait for you to move before I move on to the second topic? Certainly. The second topic, Judge, is I'm just asking, I'll do an oral tennis motion to compel in terms of if the state is aware of any change in testimony by Mr. Rivera in terms of what he's going to testify today, if they are aware of any statements that have changed, they are under an obligation under the rules of discovery to let us know before he takes the stand. So I would just ask if they are aware of any, they just let us know before he testifies, and that's the second thing, Your Honor. Mr. Kaplan, the second issue? The second issue, I'm aware of my continuing discovery obligation and my obligations under Brady, and I'm not aware of any new items to disclose at this time. Okay. And let me say to counsel, when we break, I always ask if there are any issues from you. What I want you to do is bring up issues then so we don't have the jury sitting back there waiting on us. The idea is we'll use our time to resolve issues while the jury's taking a break, so let's try to abide by that. If you have an issue, you know who's next, let's take it up at the end of the testimony before we take a break while the jury's having their break. Let's have Mr. Rivera in, please. Have a seat, sir. Let's have a jury, please. All rise for the jury. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
And what did you have to do in exchange for your 19-year sentence in this case? Cooperate. All right. I don't know. There's somebody canceled this line. Every time we move this. And Mr. Rivera, if you could pull up just a little bit closer. <coughs> yes, sir. All right, Mr. Rivera, you said that you had to cooperate in exchange for the testimony. Yes, ma'am. All right, and what does cooperate mean to you? Say nothing but the truth. Has anybody told you what to say? No, ma'am. Anybody try to tell you what the truth is? No, ma'am. Anybody try to tell you any particular fact you need to include in your testimony in order to get? Not at all. Okay, in order to get anything? No, ma'am. Any benefit? No, ma'am. Did I ever have any private meetings with you before you decided to cooperate with law enforcement? Not at all. <coughs> Did you have an attorney to represent you through the process where you cooperated and entered a plea in this case? Yes, ma'am. Did your lawyers ever tell you what you needed to say to get a deal? No, ma'am. Were you ever told that you had to implicate a specific person in order to get cooperation in this case? No, ma'am. Has anyone promised you anything other than what we just discussed, the 19 years concurrent with the federal sentence? No, ma'am. Have you been promised anything on your federal case in exchange for your testimony here today? Not at all. Were you already serving a sentence on the federal case when law enforcement first came to talk to you about this case? Yes, ma'am. And you also have pending violations of probation out of Miami, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. For possession of a firearm by a convicted felon? Yes, ma'am. So you have not yet been sentenced on that? Not at all. And is that up to a potential 15 additional years in prison? I believe so. And also a possession of cocaine with intent to sell, do you have that open as well? Yes, ma'am. And is that in another additional 15 years of prison that you could potentially face once you're done with all of this? Probably. All right. And have you been promised anything in reference to those other charges out of Miami? Not at all. Where were you living back in 2014? I was in Miami. I was living with Jessica. All right. And was Jessica at 135th Street? 135th Street yes, in North Miami. Yes, ma'am. That sound right? Do you know Sigfredo Garcia? Yes, ma'am. How do you know Sigfredo Garcia? Childhood. We grew up together. And when you say that, was it like since you were what age? Uh, like five, six, around there. Okay. Were your families close to each other? Uh, they know each other. Did you grow up in the same neighborhood? Yes, ma'am. Go to the same schools? Yes, ma'am. Run with the same crowd? Yes, ma'am. Does Mr. Garcia have any nicknames? Just Tuto. Tuto? What, have you ever heard the term Tuto Dade? Yeah. Nah. What about, um, let me ask you, like back around the time that this crime occurred, 2014, how often did you hang out with Mr. Garcia during that time frame? We hang out pretty close every day. All right. And you mentioned a Jessica. Who's that? That's my ex baby mama. Well, your my ex? baby mama. She's the mother of your children? Yes, ma'am. All right. And that's who you were living with around the time of this homicide? Yes, ma'am. What about Catherine Magbanawa? Do you know her? Yes, ma'am. How do you know her? Garcia's wife. All right. And is he legally married to her? That I knew, yeah. You I thought mean, he was? Yeah, I thought he was. Okay. And did, do they have children together? Yes, ma'am. All right. And does she go by any nicknames? Just Katie. Katie? Yeah, we just call her Katie. All right. And was... Catherine Magbano was somebody around, and I'm referring to the time leading up to this homicide, say six months leading up to the homicide. Is that somebody that you would talk to on the phone, no, Catherine Magbano? Like speak to her? Yes. No. Would you see her socially? I see her because I got I got to see Aunt Garcia. So when you saw her, would she always be with Garcia, or did you have a separate relationship with her? No, she would be with Garcia. I never had no more. Okay. I guess I'm just trying to establish, did you have a friendship with her independent of 
knowing Garcia, or was she just Garcia's woman to you? That was Garcia's woman. Okay. How much time would you say you spent around the two of them socially, then like as a couple? I mean, I was always around Garcia, but you know, everybody do their own thing. Okay. Did you, would you say you saw them socially more than 10 times in your life? Yeah, of course. Uh, was the nature of Magbanoa and Garcia's relationship such that they were always together, steady, or did they tend to break up and get back together? They're on and off. Do you know what their status was of their relationship at the time that Dan Markell was killed? I don't think I knew that she was dating on the dentist. That's about it. You did not know she was dating the dentist? No, she did. was dating. You did. Dating. Okay, so they were kind of off at that time. Yeah, they were off. All right. I want to show you some photographs, which I've marked as states 45 and 46, and ask if you recognize them. States 45 and 46. I think we were going out to the club that day. Are these photographs? Yes, ma'am. Who are they photographs of? Let's start with 45. This one. Me, Jessica, Duto, and Katie. All right. And are these fair and accurate photographs of the four of you? Yeah. Is this a photograph taken um, when the four of y'all were hanging out socially? Yes. Yeah. Judge, at this time, I'd ask to introduce into evidence case exhibit 45. Any objection? None from the defense. None from Garcia. Judge. All right, it'll be admitted. Uh, only objection, Judge, is there's no time frame that's been established for that photograph. You, you have an idea when these were taken, Mr. Rivera? You Do you have any time photos? idea oh. when these photos were shown? I, I can't remember. I can't remember. Sometime prior to the homicide that we're here about? Oh, shit. No, I don't think so. You think it could have been after? Probably after. Okay. Yeah. Uh, objection? I'll just rest my objection on that, Your Honor. He says he's probably, he doesn't know when that was taken. Uh, I'll overrule the objection. Admit State's Exhibit 45. And State's Exhibit 46, what is that a photo of? Me and Garcia. When that photo was taken? <coughs> no, not really. Okay, is that the two of y'all hanging out together socially? Yes, ma'am. All right, and are the two of you, I guess if you know, what is your height? What is your height and Mr. Garcia's height? I'm 5'4". He's like 6'1". You're 5'4 and he's 6'1"? Yes, ma'am. And is that demonstrated in that photo? Yeah. Is that fair and accurate depiction of the difference in y'all's height? Of course, he just um, leaned down a little bit, but he's tall. All right, Judge, at this time I'd ask to introduce into evidence states 46. Any objection? Yes, Judge. He indicated he wasn't sure when that photograph was taken. He also indicated. Uh, you have a legal objection. State your legal objection, please. Oh, so you can't authenticate it. All right, I'll overrule the objection. Admit states exhibit 46. You may. Was there a time when Mr. Garcia approached you about coming to Tallahassee? Yes, ma'am. And when was that? 2014. Okay. Do you know how long before the homicide it was that Mr. Garcia first approached you about coming to Tallahassee? A few months. All right. And what did Mr. Garcia say when he approached you about coming to Tallahassee? He just said, um, I got a job. He gave me a job I got to go do. 
He said he had a job. Yes, ma'am. And the job was in Tallahassee? Yes, ma'am. And did he ask you to come with him? Yes, ma'am. Did you ask any questions about what the nature of the job was, why you needed to go all the way to Tallahassee, or anything like that? No, ma'am. Why not? Uh, that's just my best friend, and I trust him. So you were automatically in to do whatever it was he wanted you to do? Whatever you wanted to do over the road. All right. Was money discussed as far as how you'd be compensated for this job? Yeah. Tell us about that. Um, he was going to give me some money. He said, take a ride with me over to uh, Tallahassee, and um, I'll give you some money. Did he say how much? At that moment, yeah, he did. Thirty-five. All right. Thirty-five what? Thirty-five thousand. You were going to get $35,000 for this job? Yes, ma'am. All right. And <clears throat> did you have another conversation in the car on the way to Tallahassee? Yes, ma'am. How many trips did you make to Tallahassee? Like tw twice. All right. And were both trips with Mr. Garcia? Yes, ma'am. Was anybody else in the car on either of those trips? Not at all. All right. Tell us about the conversation on the way to Tallahassee. Was this the first trip or the second trip? This um the first trip. All right, tell us about that. We were just taking a ride up there. <clears throat> My concern, I thought I was going to go rob him. So. Say that again? And My concern, I thought I was going to go rob him. You thought you were coming to Tallahassee to do a robbery? Yes, ma'am. Did you assume that, or did somebody tell you that? No, I assumed them, like, you know, it was just a job. All right. So you knew it was a job in Tallahassee, and you assumed it was a robbery. Did you learn something additional about what it was on the way to Tallahassee? Yeah, on the way coming up. Like halfway there, we just, he said we're going to have to um, kill the man. For some so kids. you're going to have to kill the man? Yeah. And what was the second part of what you said? For some kids. For some kids. All right. Anything else? What did that mean to you, kill the man for some kids? That's for a lady. Um, I guess the lady wanted her kids back. All right. So is this Garcia telling you this? Yeah. Did he have any information about who it was you were coming to Tallahassee to kill? If he had information for who we're coming to kill? Yeah. Yeah. What information did he have? He had a piece of paper. And where was the piece of paper? He had it in his hand at that moment. Okay. Did you see the piece of paper? Did you see what was on it? Yes, ma'am. What was on it? A picture of the the guy on... What's his name? Dan Markell? Dan Markell. The guy that y'all ended up killing. Yes, ma'am. That's the leading judge. Overruled. Is that the person whose picture was on the paper? Yes, ma'am. All right. And was there anything else on the paper other than a picture of Mr. Markell? I think it was the address in it, too. Okay. And who was doing the driving on this first trip? He was. Okay. And during the time that he showed you this paper, was he behind the wheel of the car? Yes, ma'am. All right. And do you know where the paper was stored inside the car? It was on the side of um, where you drive it by the door. Okay. Who was responsible for getting the car to go on the first trip? He did. Mr. Garcia? Yeah, he brought the car. All right. So you didn't, or did you, accompany him to rent the car for the first trip? No, ma'am. Do you know what your phone number was at the time of this homicide? I think it was like seven, either 786, I think it was like 290. Can no, your know? phone number. My phone number? Yeah. Shit. And I had two phones. Um, if I say the phone number, would you be able to say that was correct or not? Let me hear it, please. Uh, 305 570 Eight one five three. Yeah. That was one of your phone that numbers? That was one of my phone numbers. And then I also have a 305-934-6615. Was that a phone number that belonged to you? Yeah. Okay. And was there one number in particular that of those two that you took to Tallahassee? I don't remember which one I took. Did you definitely take one of them to Tallahassee? Yeah, yes ma'am. Okay. I want to ask you about the uh, first trip. Um, do you know the date that you came to Tallahassee on the first trip? The date. I 
can't remember, but uh, no, I can't remember. Okay, does June 4th through June 5th sound correct? Yeah, it's around June. That's okay, right. and that's of the year 2014, right? Yes, ma'am. All right, so do you know, are you familiar with a ticket, a traffic ticket that y'all got in the area of Gainesville on that first trip? Yes, ma'am. All right, I'm going to show you what I've marked as States Exhibit 81. You recognize States 81? Yes, ma'am. Is that a fair and accurate copy of the traffic ticket that y'all received on this first trip to Tallahassee? Yes, ma'am. All right, and this was in the car that was rented by Mr. Garcia? Yes, ma'am. Who got the ticket? I got the ticket. All right. Judge, at this time, I'd ask to introduce some evidence. Eighty-one. Any objection? No, not at all, Judge. Not Mr. Garcia. No objection. Be admitted. What was the ticket for? Uh, speeding. Okay. And so, you were doing the driving, at least in the Gainesville area, is that right? Yeah, we had switch for a minute, and you told me to drive. Do you know what time of day you arrived in Tallahassee on that first trip on June 4th? In the morning, like around 5, 6 o'clock in the morning around there. Okay. And would it refresh your memory to look again this traffic ticket was received? Let me see. I'm going to draw your attention to the top right corner of this traffic ticket indicates that you received a ticket at 9 12 a.m. in Gainesville, Florida. Does that sound right? Yeah. It does? When you came to Tallahassee that first time, did you have any guns with you? Yes, ma'am. And what guns were in the car with you on that first trip? We had two guns, okay. two thirty-eights. Two thirty-eights. Yes, ma'am. And where, where did those guns come from? One was his, and one was mine. One was whose? Garcia's. All right. And was that a gun that he acquired just for this trip, or something he'd already had? He already had. All right. What about the gun that was yours? I bought it. Where did you buy it? In the corner. On the corner, so it was an, an illegal gun purchase. Yes, ma'am. And was which one of these guns, if either of them, ended up being the murder weapon in this case? The one that I brought. All right, the one that you purchased on the corner? Yes, ma'am. And that was before the first trip to Tallahassee? That was the first trip. All right, so what was the purpose of the first trip? We came home um, to scope them out. Okay, were you intending to commit the murder on the first trip? It was supposed to, but um, we couldn't find them. All right, so... When y'all came to do the first trip, was any money exchanged? Not yet, money. Who did? Garcia. How much money did he have? He probably had, I think, from two grand or five grand. Between two and five grand? Yeah. Okay, and did you know where he got the money from? The money he got it from the people that hired him. All right, and who were that? who was that? Did he tell you? No, he didn't tell me yet. Okay. Did he give you any money on this first trip? Excuse me? Did he give you any money for this first yeah, he gave trip? a couple of hundred dollars. Okay. How many nights did you stay in Tallahassee on that first trip? If you remember. I said like two nights. All two right. or three nights. Did you, where did y'all stay? In a hotel. Okay. And did you interact with a man by the name of Shadrick Nobles in the hotel? Yes, ma'am. And you said that you came here to do the murder, but you couldn't find him. What did you mean by that? Uh, we had followed him. And we, um, followed we who? Mark Hill. All right. Where did you follow him to? Followed him all the way to a daycare. Where we kept losing him. Okay. Where did you follow him? When you say you followed him to the daycare, where did you start following him? Like, uh, 
we had stopped by a park and we watched him come out of his house. So you knew where his house was located? Yes, ma'am. How did you know where Mr. Markell's house was? First, he appointed his house to me. Okay. Was that something that was written on the paper? Yes, ma'am. All right, and you said you pulled into a park and waited for him. Where was the park? I was in the corner by a light. United States 47? Yes, ma'am. Is this a fair and accurate uh, aerial map depicting where you parked that day waiting for Mr. Markell to follow him or scope him out? Yes, ma'am. Judge, at this time I'd ask to introduce States 47. Get any pictures. One second, Judge. <coughs> no objection from Mr. Garcia. No objection. Be admitted. Yeah, you may. Yes, ma'am. Right. And when you, had you already seen Mr. Uh, Markell's home before you parked here? Yes, ma'am. Right. And when he pulled out, did he pull out down this road right here? Yes, ma'am. Okay. When you're talking about the light, are you talking about the intersection? Yes. All right. Tell me where you followed him. If he came down this way, where did y'all go? Pulled right behind him, and he went straight. Straight down through this light? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. All right. And when you say you lost him, where where, and how did you lose him? Uh, he had pulled up into the daycare. And we just, by the time we made a circle, I guess he had pulled down and left. So we kept losing him. All right. And when you talk about following Mr. Markell to the daycare on this first trip, who was driving when you all followed him to the daycare? Garcia. All right. Did y'all, you mentioned going by Mr. Markell's residence. Can you tell the jury exactly what kind of scoping out y'all did of Mr. Markell's residence on this trip? Just driving through to see if we see his car, to see if there was somebody on the house, but we never got to see his car. Did you ever pull around behind the, the house or go anywhere besides other than driving right in front? Yeah, we went around the house. Okay, did you get out of the car? No, ma'am. Did Mr. Garcia get out of the car? Yes, ma'am. Tell us about that. He got off, went behind the house, tried to see if somebody was in the house. <clears throat> Who was supposed to be the shooter on this first trip? I was going to be the shooter. Did you make a suggestion to change the plan from shooting to something else? Yeah, I found out with the for the kids. I ain't gonna shoot nobody in front of no kids. All right. Did when you saw Mr. Markell on the first trip, did he have his kids with him? Yes, ma'am. All right. Why didn't the murder get done on the first trip? Is it because we lost him? Okay. Did you ever observe Mr. Markell on the first trip where he was? I guess separated from his children? Excuse me? Did you ever see him where he was in his car or in his home and the kids were not around that first trip? No, nah, he always had his kids. Did y'all discuss plans to, you know, I guess y'all went back to Miami, correct? After yes, the failed first trip. And did, was there any plans discussed about when to come back? No, ma'am. All right, what about between the two trips? Was there a conversation about the homicide or coming back to Tallahassee? Excuse me, what two trips? The two trips? Between the two trips. Did y'all talk about when you're going to come back or? No, when we left that first night, we left. We didn't talk about it. You did or did not? Did not. Okay. What, how did it come about that y'all came back? He ended up calling me, he said, you got to do the job. We got to finish that job. And did y'all return to Tallahassee on July 16th, 2014? Yes, ma'am. And how did you get to Tallahassee that time? We rented a car. Who rented the car? I did. All right. 
I'm going to show you what's been introduced into evidence as space 82. Have you seen this exhibit before? Yes, ma'am. Is this the rental agreement that you were presented at this car? Yes, ma'am. It's a green Prius, right? Yes, ma'am. I can't remember. Who went with you to rent the Prius, if anyone? Well, it was me and Garcia. He waited for me in the corner. I went in, um, gave him $300, and rented a car. Okay. Did you refer to Mr. Garcia as your brother? Yeah, always. Who drove to Tallahassee in the green Prius? I did. Where did y'all stay in Tallahassee on the second trip? Same hotel. Okay, I'm going to show you what I've marked as States Exhibit 83. United States 83? Yes, ma'am. All right, is that the receipt from, and I think this one is, it shows an arrival date of July 16th. Is that your information? Yes, ma'am. Is that a fair and accurate copy of what you filled out to register in the hotel here in Tallahassee? Yes. Okay, Judge, at this time I'd ask to move into evidence States Exhibit 83, which is accompanied by a certification or declaration of authenticity by the folks at the budget in. Budget in. Yes, sir. Is there objection? Just to confirm, this is on the July 16th, 2014 test. This one, correct? Correct. Right. Okay, no objection from Mr. Garcia. No objection. Be admitted. Yeah. You may. Yes, ma'am. This is the name, address, and so forth? Yes, ma'am. What about this phone number? There's another phone number on here. Do you know who that belongs to? Is that a real phone number? I don't think so. You don't think so? It's not a real phone number at I want to talk about Thursday, July 17th. So you came, you spent the night at the Budget Inn, you woke up on Thursday, July 17th. What happened that day? Woke up, um, took a ride to my girl's house that Thursday morning. And, um, we went around the house. So we went around the house, we came back around, and uh, we seen a lady walking through. Mm -hmm. Where was the lady? She was towards. She was towards my right hand side, towards his house. Markel's towards house. whose house? Towards Markel's house. Mm -hmm. Okay. Was she in the street on the sidewalk or sidewalk. something else? Okay. Did she have children with her? Yes, ma'am. Two. All right. What happened when you saw this lady? Did she see you? Yeah, she looked dead at the car. I was driving, and um, as I looked in my rear view, I seen her looking. Mm-hmm. So what I happened asked, next? I asked Garcia. What's up with this lady? Why she looking at the car? You know, that's that lady with the kids, man. So you ask Garcia, hey, who's this lady that's looking at the car? Yes, ma'am. And he said, that's the lady with the kids. Yes, ma'am. And what did you take that to mean? That's the lady that wanted the kids. The, the lady that wanted you to do this job? Yes, ma'am. All right. And were you worried about seeing her there? Yes, ma'am. Were you worried about her seeing you there? Of course. Um, were you concerned? Did you ever ask Garcia, who knows that I'm involved in this job with you? I can't remember. Can't remember that? No. Okay. What did you do once you see this lady and Garcia tells you that's the lady that wants this job done? We, we drove off. We left. Okay. 
Did Garcia make a phone call about seeing the lady? Well, I'm looking to the rear mirror and I seen her making a phone call. I've seen okay. her getting on the phone. The lady that you saw on the sidewalk? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And then y'all drove off? We drove off. Okay. And did Mr. Garcia, after seeing that and driving off, did he make any phone calls? After we don't bend at the corner, mm -hmm. he got on the phone. All right. And who did he get on the phone with? I believe he got on the phone with Katie. How do you know it was Katie he got on the phone with? Because she, like, <coughs> the way he was talking, it's only okay. her. He, don't, he only talks to her. All right. And what do you mean the way he was talking? How are you able to tell? Like, um, when he spoke to her, she like, yeah, um, y'all get out of there. The lady just seen y'all. All right. And so y'all were worried about this lady having seen you? Oh, I was worried. You were? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And were you able, you said that you believe Garcia called Katie. Could you actually hear her or you could only hear his end of the conversation? I'm hearing his end of the conversation right now. All right. And tell us about his end of the conversation. What did you hear? He like, we just got to go. Like, let's get out of here. Okay. Did you learn anything about Mr. Markell planning to leave town? Yes. Tell us about that. We had to get the job done because he was supposed to leave that Friday morning. How did you know that? Garcia told me. And how did he know that? Katie told him. And when Katie told him that, was that something that happened while you were present or something that he already knew before y'all arrived there? No, I was present. I was in the car. Did you post a picture on Instagram while y'all were in Tallahassee on that second trip? Yes, ma'am. Could you tell the jury about that? It was a picture of an owl. An owl, like the bird? Yeah. Okay. And was that a photograph that you took here in Tallahassee? Yes, ma'am. All right. What happened after you posted this picture of an owl on Instagram? Garcia came and told me, hey, you need to take that shit down. Just like that. Garcia told you that? Yes, ma'am. And who told him that? I believe Katie. You believe Katie or no, you know Katie? It's, it's Katie. It's her. Okay. So did Garcia get a phone call about the Instagram photo that you posted? Yes, ma'am. And were you present when he received that phone call? I was outside. Okay. He came outside and told me. He came outside and told you to take it down? Yeah. All right. And did you all have contact with that same gentleman that you all saw the first trip, Shadrick Nobles? Did you all see him on the second trip? Yes, ma'am. All right. Could you tell the jury about the circumstances of coming into contact with Mr. Nobles on the second trip? Buying drugs. All right. And was there an issue with your car as well? Yes, ma'am. Could you tell the jury about the issue with the car? There was an issue in the car. At, um, I was driving, and Garcia pulled a gun out and um, shot a hole right through the car. All right. What gun did he shoot the car with? Oh, uh, the, the homicide one. The 38. The the murder weapon. The murder weapon. The gun that you bought on the street corner. Yes, ma'am. All right. And I assume that was an accidental shooting of the car? Yeah, it was an accident. Where did this occur? Were you all in the parking lot or somewhere else? And I was driving. All right. Did it disable the vehicle? Of course. All right. So what did y'all do as a result of the vehicle <laughs> being disabled? And this is the green Prius, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Go ahead and tell us what y'all did. Well, the car has stopped because he had the gas line. So um, pushed it right to, to the side of the road, so like a little parking lot. Mm -hmm. uh, he left with Cedric to the uh, auto zone and got a little piece of hose to come fix it up. It only took him like about 10 minutes to fix it. So Garcia got a ride with Mr. Nobles? Yes, ma'am. All right, and we're, who fixed the car? Garcia. All right, was he able to do that with whatever he bought at the auto parts store? Of course. And then it ran again after that? Yes, ma'am. And did Mr. Nobles assist y'all with getting a hotel room that second night in Tallahassee? Yes. All right, I want to talk about what happened on July 18th, 2014. Who was driving the green Prius that day? I was. Where did y'all go when you left the hotel? To Markel's house. All right, and was Mr. Markel, was his vehicle there? That's that Friday. Yes, sir. His vehicle, we had pulled, but um, we passed by. We didn't see it, so we went to the corner, the same spot of that park. We posted up and um, waited for him to come around. So once I seen him, we followed him. 
Where did you follow him? All the way to the daycare. All right. And did you see him drop his children off at the daycare? Yes, ma'am. And did you continue to follow him? Yes, ma'am. Where did you follow him from the daycare? To the gym. All right. And are you still driving at this point? I'm still driving. And Mr. Garcia is the passenger? Yes, ma'am. Uh, did you continue to use your cell phones once you got into the area of Premier Gym? No, uh, I think the cell phone was off. I think, I can't remember. Okay. You don't remember whether you turned your phone off or not? Yeah, I can't remember if it was on or off. Okay. Have you seen the Premier Gym video? I've seen the gym. And you saw the images of that green Prius circling around while Mr. Markell was working out in the gym? Yeah. And was that you in that vehicle? Yes, ma'am. And Mr. Garcia? Yes, ma'am. What happened once uh, Mr. Markell came out of the gym? We followed him all the way back to his house. And have you seen the images that were on the bus bus cameras? Have I seen the images? Yeah, the video from the bus cameras. Yeah, I've seen them. All right. And is that y'all b both before and right after the murder of Mr. Markell? Yes, ma'am. Right. Did, on the way to the murder, I see only your car, the Prius, turning onto Benton Road. I do not see Mr. Markell's. Why is that? We went the other, he, um, he went one way and went the other way. And what do you mean by that? He turned before you or after you? He turned before me. Okay. So he turned to get to his house another way, and you turned on Benton. Yes, the corner of his house. Okay. That corner right there by the park? Yes, ma'am. All right. And so when you were approaching Mr. Markell's residence, was he coming from the other direction? Yes, ma'am. What happened once the two of y'all were headed toward each other? He pulled in, and I, I pulled right, right behind him. How close did you get up behind him? Real close. <laughs> And what was Mr. Markell doing when you pulled up behind he, him? He was on the phone. All right, still seated in the driver's seat of his vehicle? Yes, ma'am. And what happened once you pulled into his driveway? As soon as I pulled in, Garcia jumped off, jumped out of the car and went around. Not around, but in front of, my, in front of the car. Mm -hmm. Right behind his car and in front of um, the car I was driving. Went to the um, driver's side and shot him. He shot Mr. Markell? Yes, ma'am. How many times? Twice. Did you actually see Mr. Garcia shoot Mr. Markell? Of course. Were the shots close together? Yes, ma'am. Can you describe Mr. Garcia's shooting position, like how he was holding the gun? One hand. All right. Was it raised up, or was it like a normal arm, pretty straight shooting position? A raised up, pretty straight. Okay. And did... Mr. Garcia, did you observe him touch anything in the... Did he have to go inside the garage to kill Mr. Markell? Yes, ma'am. And did you see him touch anything inside the garage? No, ma'am. All right, and when he shot Mr. Markell, can you tell the jury anything about how close the gun was to Mr. Markell? Pretty close. Okay, would you say inches, feet? Just inches away. Did you see Mr. Garcia go inside the house at all? Not at all. Did he take anything from Mr. No. Markell other than his life? No, ma'am. What did y'all do once Mr. Garcia shot Mr. Markell? He got in the car and left. And who was driving? Me. All right. Which way did y'all go? The same way we came in. All right. Up Thomasville Road? Um, this day by the corner of the park. Okay, so you turned at the corner by the park. Yeah. And then did you turn at the light? Yes, made a right and just left. All right. Did y'all get on the interstate and head back to Miami? Yes, ma'am. Do you see the person in the courtroom who shot Mr. Markell? Yes, ma'am. Could you please point that person out and describe what he's wearing? Garcia. He's wearing a tux. A tux? Yeah. What color is the shirt? Blue. Let the record reflect the witness has identified the defendant Garcia. On the bus video that we talked about a little earlier, in the moments after the homicide, there's some like 
animated movement that's seen in the passenger side of the Prius. Can you tell us what that what that was, what was happening at that time? Oh, he was just trying to hide the gun. Who was? Garcia. Where was he trying to hide the gun? Right in front of um, the uh, passenger side. Okay. And what was Mr. Garcia's demeanor like? What was he acting like when he got back in the car after killing Mr. Markell? He was nervous. What happened to the murder weapon in this case? We dumped it. Where did y'all dump it? In the lake. All right, what lake? In the bridge, um, in no telling. In one of the bridges. All right, was it on the way between the Tallahassee way and Miami? Yes, ma'am. And were you able to say exactly which bridge it was? I can't remember. But the gun was thrown into a body of water? Yes, ma'am. And who threw the gun into the body of water? Garcia. Did you ride around with law enforcement much later looking for this location? Yes, ma'am. All right. Have you seen the ATM images in this case? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Who's that? That's me. Who's that? Garcia. What car is it? The Prius. Is that the day of the homicide? Yes, ma'am. Sir? Yes, ma'am. What were you doing at the ATM? I was just getting money out. Why did you need to get money out if you got a couple hundred dollars already for the uh, murder? We got ran out. Y'all had run out of money by then? Yeah. Do you know which one of you had the first phone call once the murder occurred, you or Mr. Garcia? Garcia. And <coughs> do you know when that phone call was made or where y'all were when the I phone was, call was made? I was, driving to, I was driving back to Miami. All right. And who was the first phone call? Did he receive a phone call or he made a phone call? remember right there. And who was the fir first phone call with? Katie. All right, so Garcia either called Katie or got a call from Katie, and that yes. was the first call that either of y'all made after the murder? Yes, ma'am. All right, and was, how do you know that that call was to Katie? Because he, when he was speaking, he like, hey, the shit is done. She goes, I already know it's done. All right, and when she said, I already know it's done, was that something that you heard or that Garcia told you? I heard. How were you able to hear it? Because I'm in the car with him. The All window's right. up and she's on the phone. So her voice was loud enough through the receiver that you were yes, able to hear her. And could you identify her voice as being hers and not somebody else's? Yes, ma'am. All right. So tell us again what exactly was said. He said, um, we're already finished because I already know it's done. All right. And then what? And then we asked for the money. Like, where the money at? So you'll get it tomorrow. Who said you'll get it tomorrow? Katie. Who was responsible for getting the money? I believe Katie. All right, and you said, why do you say you believe Katie? Was it Katie or not? Yes, it was Katie. All right, and did you know where she was gonna get the money from? If I knew, not really, but we know the lady, Wendy, was paying it. All right, so you knew that the job was being done so that Wendy could get her kids? Yes, ma'am. Did you go with Katie to get the money? No, ma'am. All right, and when Katie said you'll get the money, what exactly did she say? I'm not sure you've said You'll get the yet. money tomorrow. You'll get the money tomorrow. And was that okay with you? Not really. I mean, the job is done. We should get the money today. All right. Did y'all go back and forth about that a little bit? Not at all. All right. So she's going to get the money and you were going to get it tomorrow. Yes, ma'am. And did you get the money the next day? Yes, ma'am. That's going to be Saturday the 19th? Yes, ma'am. July 19th, 2014? Yes. Your financial records indicate that you went to Big Daddy's the night of the murder. Is that, is that a place in Miami? Yes, ma'am. What kind of place is that? Uh, Big Daddy, you got a bar and then you got a Flanagan's right next to it. Okay. Is Flanagan's also a bar or is that something else? It's together. Okay. Yeah, it's a bar. It's a, um, a sport, sport bar. Is that a place that you hung out regularly? Not really. Okay. But you went there that night? Yes, ma'am. And what about Mr. Garcia? Did he go there with you? Yes, ma'am. Did you all spend some money that night? Yes. Were y'all celebrating? We can't call it celebrating, but we, yeah, we, we spent some money. All right, but you hadn't been paid yet. No, not at all. Okay, but you were anticipating getting some money the next day. Yes, ma'am. 
Did you know how much Mr. Garcia was getting paid for his role in this murder? Forty grand. Forty grand, and that's what he told you? Yes, ma'am. Did you know how much Katie was getting for her role in this murder? The rest. The rest of what? The money. How much money was it total? A hundred grand. A hundred grand? Yes, ma'am. That's how much the job was? Yes, ma'am. When did you learn that? My, um, I asked Garcia, he's giving me 35, <coughs> and he's getting 40. I said, how much is in total? He said, 100. Katie, get the rest. All right. So you said that you got paid the next day. Uh, tell us about that. I was in a barbershop the next morning. I get a phone call from Katie. Hey, what's Tuto? What's Tuto? And Tuto is Mr. Garcia? Yes, ma'am. All right, so Katie, you talked to Katie on the phone that day. Yes, I did. And that was pretty unusual because y'all don't usually talk on the phone, right? Yes, ma'am, we don't. All right, and she says, where's Tuto? Did you know where Tuto was? Objection meeting. Yes. Uh -huh. Overruled. And where was Tuto? And Shrimp's house. And who's Shrimp? Oh, uh, his girlfriend. Okay, so that's a woman that he was seeing around that time? Yes, ma'am. All right, and what did she say? Did she say anything about the money? Yeah, she said, who's going to come get this money? I said, he is. You go get it. All right, so she wanted to know who was going to come get the money. Yes, ma'am. And were you able to locate Mr. Garcia? Of course. And did y'all go get the money? I didn't go get it. He went and get it. You he didn't get your it. money? I was in a barbershop still. They brought the money to my house. Okay, and did you go to your house to get the money? Yes, ma'am. Who was present when you went to your house and got your money? Garcia and Katie. All right, and is that the house that we talked about earlier that you lived at with Jessica? Yes, ma'am. All right, so you go, you leave the barbershop, is that right? Yes, ma'am. And go to your house? Yes. Who gave you the money? Garcia. All right, and C Catherine Magbana was, was present as well? She was there. All right, and tell us about the money. How was it packaged? It was in a brown, um, a brown bag. Okay. Like a brown paper bag or a plastic? A brown paper bag. All right, and what about inside the brown paper bag? It was like a little clear plastic, a, a plastic bag inside of it as well. All right, and what was inside the clear plastic bag? Money, all hundreds. All hundreds? Yes, ma'am. And did you count the money? No. How do you know how much was there? Because I trust them. All right, so you were told it was 35000 Yes, ma'am. And did it seem like about that much to you? Yes, ma'am. And you said it was all hundreds. Were they... Um, Separated it all into stacks? They were stapled. Stapled? A thousand dollars stapled, each each one of them. So stacks of hundreds stapled together with like a stapler? Yeah, with a stapler. Not mm -hmm. all of them together, but a thousand dollars each was stapled. Okay. So you had a bunch of stacks of hundred dollar bills that were stapled into stacks of a thousand. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Who is Anthony Ortiz? That's one of my friends. All right. Is that a person that would know how to find you? Yes, ma'am. All right. And did Catherine Magbanoa know Anthony Ortiz? Yeah. And do you know his number, or if I say his number, would you be able to say yes or no that that's his number? Yeah. 305-762-0648. That's his number. Did you get any additional money other for this murder other than the money that you got in that brown paper bag? Yeah, he gave me an extra two grand. Who did? Garcia. When was that? In the car. <coughs> you say in the car. Was that the same day that you got the 35 grand? Yes, ma'am. Are you aware of any purchases that Mr. Garcia made with his portion of the money from this murder? Yes, ma'am. And what purchases were those? Uh, we just bought some toys. Like what? Like cars, motorcycles. What about you? Did you buy any toys? Yeah, I bought a motorcycle. Right, I'm going to approach with States Exhibits 48.
start with 48. Do you recognize that exhibit? Yes, ma'am. How do you recognize it? Let's go see his motorcycle and the Monte Carlo is his. Is this a fair and accurate photo of the toys that he bought with the proceeds of this murder? Yes, ma'am. Judge, at this time, I'd ask to introduce States 48. Any objection? Judge, if I may. Excuse me. No, nah, just one. Which one? The yellow one. Yellow and black one. one in the front? Yes, ma'am. And what about this vehicle back here? Did you purchase that one money for the Yes, ma'am. This is number 49. Do you recognize that? Yes, ma'am. What does that show? Me and Garcia on the motorcycles. Is the motorcycles y'all bought with the money from killing Mr. Markell? Yes, ma'am. Judge, at this time I'd ask to move in evidence states 49. Any objection? No objection. To be admitted. 49 will be admitted. Do you know what Catherine Magbanawa did with her cut of the money? Not really. Did you dump your phone, the phone that you took to Tallahassee, did you dump that phone after the murder? No, I think I just changed the number. Changed the number? And did you change the number because it might have been associated with a homicide? Yes, ma'am. What happened to the Prius? Well, we turned it back. The Who Prius, turned it back in? I turned it back in. Was it turned in on time? No. Tell us about that. Well, Garcia used it at night, went out. He took the Prius, parked it somewhere around the house. He said he lost it. He said he didn't know where he put it at. So I had to go over there and look for it. Found it like, like a block and a half away from where he lived at, in Miami right. Beach. Miami Beach? Yeah. And so the Prius was a few days late, right? Yeah. Are you familiar with a wire intercept, a T3 wire intercept that was done in reference to this case? Not really. Have you had an opportunity to review some recorded calls that were captured on a, a disc? I heard it from one of my own girls. Say that again? I heard, I heard it before. Okay, were you, did you remember coming and listening with Investigator Newland to some phone calls and initialing whether or not you knew who the voices were on those calls? Wait, that could be Newman? Newland, Investigator Jason Newland. Did you meet with him? Yeah, I met with him. Okay, and did he play some phone calls for you? And the gist of that was asking you, can you recognize the voices yes. on these calls? You remember that? Yes, ma'am. All right, I'm going to approach with State's Exhibit 138.
everybody be seated, please. You may proceed, Ms. Kaplan. When we broke, I was asking you whether you recalled um, having a meeting where you listened to some phone calls, the recorded phone calls from this case, to identify the voices. Do you remember that? Yes, ma'am. I'm going to approach with what I've marked as states. Do you recognize this sheet? Yes, ma'am. And is this your initial here? Yes, ma'am. All right. And what about these check marks? What do these check marks indicate? The voices. All right. So on each of these letter phone calls, were you able to authenticate the voices that are highlighted? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So for example, on call D, you were asked to listen to see if that's. Move this into evidence. Overruled. Overruled. So, for example, on call D, you were asked to identify the voice of, there's two voices on there, and you were asked to identify the one that's highlighted, correct? Yes, ma'am. And does the check mark indicate that you were able to identify the, yes, the highlighted voice? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And on these calls, such as call K, there are two names highlighted there, Katie and Garcia. Does the check mark indicate you were able to authenticate both of those voices? Yes, ma'am. All right, and the ones that have check marks by um, Katie, is that referencing Catherine Magbanua? Yes, ma'am. So that was her voice on the call? Yes, ma'am. And the ones that have Garcia, that's referencing Sigredo Garcia's voice? Yes, ma'am. All right, and all the check marks indicate that you have authenticated those voices on those particular calls? Yes, ma'am. Right, Judge, at this time I'd ask to interview States 179. Is there a pick? Yes, Your Honor. First, I've never been shown what Ms. Kaplan is referring to, and I do want to go sidebar and lay my other objections. Improper foundation. Look, we'll go sidebar. Mr. Rivera, I don't think I asked you, what is your nickname, if you have one? Tato. Tato? Yeah. All right. And I want to take you back for a moment to the first trip to Tallahassee. Did Mr. Garcia engage in any phone calls with Ms. McVanawa during that first trip to Tallahassee? I can't remember. Do you remember giving a... Proffer in this case on 
October 4th, 2016? Yes, ma'am. And do you remember giving some statements about um, Garcia having a lot of phone contact with Ms. Magbanoa on that first trip? This is improper. Sustained. I'm going to approach and show you. Ask you to read the question and answer. Are you able to read no, very well, Mr. Can't read, can't write. All right. Judge, I'll ask for some guidance on that. I don't Sorry, give I don't guidance. Know. I don't give guidance, Ms. Okay, Kaplan. Okay, well, the question is right. How do you know that? I'm going to object to the decision. No, sustained. All right. Move on, Ms. Captain. Yes, sir. Do you have any recollection of um, any conversation, overhearing any conversation in which Ms. Magbana, Ms. Magbanawa was concerned about you and Mr. Garcia doing something stupid or messing it up? Can't remember. Do you remember any conversation that you were privy to where Mr. Garcia was telling Ms. Magbanawa to make sure those people have the money? Yeah. When was that? That was uh, Friday after the murder happened. Okay. Were there other conversations that happened on the first trip where the money was discussed? No. You don't remember Mr. Garcia telling Ms. Magbanawa that they better have the money? Now I don't remember. Okay. Slide forward a little bit more. I think you've got it back up. I'm way in the mic. Do you remember any conversation where Ms. McBanawa was indicating to Mr. Garcia where you could hear her saying, make sure you get everything done right. When you are done, call me. Yes. When was that? That was... The second trip was when um murder the guy. And were you a member of this conspiracy to accomplish the murder of Mr. Markell? Not at all. You didn't have anything to do with it? I mean, um, and yeah, he told me about it to go, but if you're saying if I got hired, no. Well, you got paid, didn't you? Yeah, from Garcia. All right, so Garcia hired you to do a murder, didn't he? Yes, ma'am. And who hired him? The um, Addison family. I'm sorry? The Wendy family. Wendy's family hired him? Yeah. Okay, and how was Wendy's family connected to Sigfredo Garcia? Because Katie, Katie was the, um, daddy, um, dating the dentist. Okay. Did Katie know about the murder? Yes, ma'am. Did Katie have a role in hiring Sigfredo Garcia? Yes, ma'am. How do you know that? Because he told me. And Katie got paid? Yes, ma'am. Objection of deleting. Sustained. Do you know which member of the Adelson family? Do you know? Did you have any contact with any no, member of the Adelson family? Did any member of the Adelson family ever pay you any money? No, ma'am. Did you ever have any phone calls with any member of the Adelson family? No, ma'am. Text messages? No. Nope. Meetings? No. Nope. Any other type of communication? Not at all. Do you see the person in the courtroom that you say hired Sigfredo Garcia to do this homicide? The only one I see is Katie. All right. Would you please point her out and describe what she's wearing? She's wearing on gray and black. Record reflects the witness has identified. Would you, would you put your hand down, please, Ms. Kepner? The witness has makes identified. It hard to hear you. Sir? Makes it hard to hear you when you've got your hand up around yes, your sir. mouth. The witness has identified Defendant Magbanawa. No further questions. Cross.
I may proceed, Judge? You may. Thank you, Judge. Good afternoon, Mr. Rivera. Good afternoon. Do you have any aliases other than your full legal name as Luis Rivera? Yeah, Tato. What about King Tato? Yeah, King Tato. And where is the nickname King Tato derived from? King is from Latin King. And Tato is my nickname since I was a baby. You're a Latin King legacy, right? Yeah. And I say that because you were born into being a Latin King, right? Yes, sir. Okay. And by being born into this organization, um, that means that you had family members that were part of the organization. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Direction, relevance. If I can explain. Same. If I can explain sidebar, Judge, it goes to material. And Mr. Rivera, what was your title with uh, the North Miami tribe of the Latin Kings uh, when you got arrested in this case? This case right here? Or the federal case? I was a leader. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's five designations of leaders in the Latin King organization, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. There, there are certain crowns, correct? There's like a fifth crown, right? Yes, sir. Okay. And uh, is that called the secretary? Yes, sir. There's a fourth crown, which is called the treasurer? Yes, sir. There's a third crown, which is called the enforcer? Yes, sir. There's a second crown that's called, I can't pronounce it, it's C-A-C-I-Q-U. C-A-C-I-Q-U. Okay. And then there's the Inca or the Primera, the first crown, correct? Yes, sir. And that's what you were? 
Yes, sir. The first crown of the North Miami tribe of the Latin Kings, correct? Yes, sir. And in addition to being a local organization, well, it's not just a local organization, is that correct? Yes, sir. There's Latin Kings throughout the state of Florida, is that correct? Yes, sir. And in, in addition to the state of Florida, I believe there's 39 states in the United States where the Latin Kings have a presence, is that correct? Yes, sir. At the time of, uh, of, of this incident in 2014, how old were you, sir? Like 32. 32. And you had been the Inca, or the first crown of the North Miami tribe since you were, in your, since you were about 15 or 16, is that correct? Yes, sir. How many members of the North Miami tribe were there in 2014? I mean, that's a question for real. I'm sorry, sir? That's a serious question. Uh, I'm asking it. That can be a lot, no doubt. How many, if you remember, as the leader of this North Miami tribe, how many members of the Latin Kings were part of the North Miami tribe in 2014? Probably had like a hundred. A hundred. Probably. Does that include all of Miami or is that just North Miami? That's just North Miami. So including Miami, that number goes up. Is that correct? Of course. And as we move exponentially north and west and a little bit south, the numbers increase, correct? Yes, sir. Would you agree with me that there is a Latin King presence in Key West? Yeah. Broward County? Yes. Tampa? Everywhere. Okay. Everywhere, right? Yes, sir. Well, I'm going to ask some specifics, and I apologize for cutting you off, but I just need to make sure I get my questions out. So St. Petersburg, yes? Yes. Because that's part of everywhere, right? Yes, sir. Naples, correct? Yes, sir. Jacksonville? Yes. What about here in Tallahassee? I don't know. Oh, you don't know. Don't Isn't know. Tallahassee part of everywhere? Yeah, but I don't, I don't associate people in Tallahassee. Never been in Tallahassee in my life. So just so I'm clear, when I ask you if there's that Latin usually King. usually means you're going to repeat a question. Let's not repeat what they're saying. So out of all the places in Florida that have Latin Kings, the only place that you're not aware if they have Latin Kings is here in Tallahassee. Is that your testimony? Yeah, I mean, they got them, but I don't know nobody from Tallahassee. So now, now you're saying that they have them, but you don't they know them, them personally, correct? They got them, but I don't know nobody in Tallahassee. Well, do you think that they know you? Maybe. Okay, and that's because you're a leader in a substantially sized tribe of the, of the Latin Kings. Is that correct? Yeah, they don't know me, but they, know my, they probably know my name. So could you pick up a phone and call somebody and get information on somebody that's associated with the Latin Kings in, let's say, Jacksonville? Could you do that? If you're the leader, of course. Okay. And you were a leader, right? Yes, sir. So what about, could you pick up the phone and find out, find out if there's people in Gainesville? You could do that as a leader, right? Yes, sir. Everywhere, right? Everywhere. Okay. Because in addition to being a local organization, it's a statewide and na national organization, correct? Yes, sir. And you've been a leader of this organization pretty much your entire adult life, correct? Yes, sir. How do, you, how do you become, what do you need to do to become a Latin king? I was born into it. What about, how do you, get, what is your definition of gangbang? Gangbang? Yes, sir. Latin king is a family. First and foremost, a family. It's an organization that everybody take care of everybody. You take care of the neighborhood. Do you recall if I ever asked you what were the things you had to do to become a Latin king? Do you recall that? Yeah. Do you recall what your answer was? No, I don't remember. If I show you a copy... You gotta read it. Of, of, I gotta read it? Yeah, I can't read. Well, let me ask you this. Did you tell me 
on October, I'm sorry, on January 31st, 2018, that to get in, initiated to the gang, you had just gangbang. Does that sound about right? Yes, sir. And would it be safe to say that when I asked you to expand on what gangbanging means, you said surviving life. Does that sound about right? Yes, sir. Does that include selling drugs? Everything, I guess. Okay. Did you sell drugs? Yes, sir. I got to hey. survive. And you did this to take care of your family, correct? Yes, sir. And to take care of the nation, right? Yes, sir. And when I say the nation, I'm discussing the Latin King Nation, correct? Yes, sir. Now, would proceeds from your illegal activity go back to the organization? Repeat that question again? Sure, no problem. Would the proceeds... What proceeds mean? Proceeds like the money you make? Okay. Okay? If, if there's ever a time where I ask a question that you don't understand what I'm saying, let me know. And I'll clarify just so I'll make sure that everybody's on the same page, all right? I'm doing it right now, sir. I'm sorry? I said I'm doing it right now. Okay. Well, I appreciate it. So proceeds means what money you make. So the money you made from your illegal activity, did you give it back to the nation? It's a treasure. You put money in a treasure. Okay. So the answer is yes. Yes. Okay. <coughs> Now, to your knowledge, let me ask it this way. Is there a, like a manual or a book that your organization uses that has rules in it? Yes, sir. And does it go by the initials KMC? Yes, sir. Tell the members of the jury what those initials stand for. You say KMC? Yes, sir. It's, it's A K M C. Amor de, amor de rey. Okay. I'm sorry. I can, I can barely understand what you're saying. Can you say that a little bit louder, sir? Amor de rey. Okay. And is that in, is that a is that English or another language? That's Spanish. Okay. And hence the name Latin Kings, correct? Latin Kings. And. Even though you can't read or write, can you translate from English to Spanish? Yes, sir. Okay, can you tell the members of this jury from English to Spanish what that means? That means all, all, almighty. Almighty love. Almighty love. And that's your rule book, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Have you ever heard it uh, initialized as KMC? Yes, sir. And do you know what, well, let me, let me, let me ask it this way. Is there a portion in that with, with regards to a code of silence that your gang has to, to, to abide by? Yes, sir. So one of the principles that's in your rule book is that whatever activity you do within your organization should maintain within that organization. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And whatever activity that you do If it's illegal, you're not supposed to talk about it, correct? Of course. Now, according to your book, the KMC, is there a punishment or a violation that one receives if you provide information against another Latin king? What do you mean by that? So let's say a buddy of yours, one of your brothers, Let's call him King Anthony, okay? Let's say King Anthony did a crime and you helped the prosecution or you helped the police prosecute him. Would that be a violation according to your rule book? Objection, relevance, and hypothetical. Overruled. Go ahead, sir. Of course. What would be your punishment? I'm for, going through it right now. They're trying to kill me. They're going to try to kill you? Yeah. So you'll agree with me that cooperating against a fellow king would result in probably the most serious penalty that you can have in your manifesto, correct? Of course. Loss of your life. Yes, sir. Now you have a tattoo designating your allegiance to your organization, correct? Yes, sir. And that's on your stomach? 
Yes, sir. And it's the five points or the five points of the crown. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And you still have that tattoo? Yes, I do. Are you still a member of the Latin Kings? No. Nope. When did you lose your membership? When I went back to Coleman, back to the Feds. Okay. 2016. When in 2016? Right when I came over here to cooperate. Okay. So the beginning of your cooperation, which I would say late September, early October, does that sound about right, sir? Yeah. You lost your affiliation because you violated one of the rules in your Latin King Manifesto, is that correct? Yes, sir. Are you in general population at Coleman? I'm sorry, You're, let me ask the question this way. Where, where are you currently housed? Um, Arizona. Okay, and that's in a federal facility? Yes, sir. And as the prosecution said, you are currently serving a 151 month sentence based on your agreement to plead guilty in a federal racketeering case. Is that yes, correct? Yes, sir. And do you know what, do you know what racketeering, sorry. I apologize, strike that question. And so as part of your federal sentence, you have been designated, designated by the Bureau of Prisons, right? Yes, sir. Okay. And your designation in the Bureau of Prisons is in a federal facility in Arizona, correct? Yes, sir. Now, for, you'll agree with me that for uh, inmates, that they're concerned for their safety and welfare, there's a special portion of the federal facility that they could put you in, right? Yes, sir. And that's called the SHU, right? Yes, sir. And the SHU stands for a special housing unit, right? Yes, sir. Are you currently in the SHU? Not right now. Okay. When you say not right now, I, I see that you're here in Leon County, right? Yes, so when you met not right now, prior to them bringing you over here, When's the last time you were in the shoe? In Leon County. I'm sorry? In Leon County. In Leon County. When you were in federal custody, were you ever in special housing? Yes, sir. Okay. What about in Arizona? The Arizona, the prison I'm in, is called a drop by yard, what is called a PC, protective custody. That's where they got me at right now. So are you in special housing in your federal facility? <clears throat> no. You're in general population, correct? Yes, sir. Have they had this, by they, well, let me, let me rephrase that. You indicated earlier that if you testified against a Latin king, you, they, they try to kill you, correct? Testify against anybody. Well, I'm asking you testifying against a Latin king. I think he answered your question. Do you have another question? Yes, Judge. What is a KOS order? KOS? Yes. KOS. Right. Kill on site? Kill on site? Are you familiar with that? I just said it, sir. Have you ever given a KOS order? No. During your, you're aware that at some point between September and November, the U.S. government put a wire intercept on your federal indictment investigation on your phone. Is that correct? Yeah, they got caught. Yeah, I knew. And what I'm asking you is this. You know that the feds had you wired up for a month. Yeah, I found out. Okay. And you found out because, like in any criminal investigation, one of the things that they do is they show you the evidence that they have against you, right? Yes, sir. And you'll agree with me that in your federal investigation, you learned that for 30 days, the federal government listened to every one of your phone calls. Is that correct? Yes, sir. In October 2014, did you have, as a Latin king, an issue 
with members of the 400 gang that moved into Highland Village. Yes, sir. And in, Octo in late October of 2014, did you, Luis Rivera, initiate a series of phone calls asking for assistance from fellow Latin King gang members? Do you yes, recall sir. doing that? And do you recall that what you initially wanted to do or what you asked your fa fellow Latin Kings, your brothers, to do was to get armed up and come and help you deal with these other gang members. Is that correct? Action, relevance. Sustain. Have you ever been involved, other than the case that we're talking about, have you ever been involved in the distribution of narcotics? Objection, relevance. May I inquire, Judge? You may. Mr. Rivera, did you sell drugs in the year 2012? Yes, sir. What drugs did you sell in the year 2012? Weed and cocaine. Did you sell drugs in the year 2013? Probably in my whole life. So would it be fair to say that from your teenage years up until your arrest, you were involved in the distribution of narcotics? Yes, sir. And I know this because we've spoken about it. It was initially just weed, right? Yes, sir. And as you got older, you started selling powder, right? Have you ever committed an armed robbery? Yes, sir. Do you remember ever giving me an answer different than that? I can't remember. Now you said that you can't you can't read or write, correct? Yes, sir. Do you know the difference between the words yes and no? <laughs> yes, sir. May I approach Judge? He, it's paid. You can't read. You're not, not going to give him something to read. That's what it's Judge, it's just a different shape between the words yes and no. No. Proceed. Do you recall 
taking a deposition with me in January, on January 31st, 2018? Yes, sir. Okay. And during that deposition, I was there, Ms. Kaplan was there? Yes, sir. And there was a person that's called the court reporter that was taking notes of what you were saying? Yes, sir. Judge, I'm going to refer to line 22 and 23. I asked you, have you ever committed an armed robbery? And your answer was no. Now, today, when I ask you that, your answer is no, the yes, question, Judge. Do you recall that question and that answer? Do you recall that question and that impeachment? Do you recall that question and answer? I can't remember. Once again, Your Honor, I would ask to be able to show the, the witness. Move on, Mr. Singer. So you indicated you have committed armed robberies, right? Yes, sir. And you gave a statement to law enforcement uh, on October 4th. Okay. I'm sorry, I thought you were through with your question. No, sir, Judge. On October 4th, 2016, you remember that? Let me kind of refresh your recollection. You're sitting there. You got your lawyer, Mr. Collins, to your right. Uh -huh. You got Detective Isom on your left, and you got an FBI investigator, Mr. Sanford, directly in front of you. I got my lawyer who to my right? Chuck Collins. I think it was David Collins. Oh, so you do remember? Yeah. Okay. I'm is trying to refresh my memory, too. Is David the older or the younger gentleman? David is the father. Is the father. Okay. So you had David Collins to your right. You remember that? Yeah. Okay, and you're sitting at a table, right? <coughs> and did they, are you, you remember that they told you that they videotaped the, the interview, correct? Yes, sir. Okay, so would it sound about right that this whole videotaped statement that you gave on October 4th, 2016, in the presence of your lawyer with Detective Isom, Detective Stanford, took about two hours long? Do you remember that? Yes, sir. And do you also remember that during that videotape statement, um, you made, you called yourself a jack boy. Do you remember that? Yes, sir. Okay. What's a jack boy? A jack boy is a rob drug dealers. Rob drug dealers. Now, when you rob a drug dealer, do you rob them on the streets or do you go to their house? Go to their house and take their dope. Because drug dealers don't keep their dope out of the streets. It's usually stashed somewhere in their house, right? Yes, sir. So I'm going to ask serious questions with regards to these. I mean, do you knock on the door and say, excuse me, can I have your drugs? Does it work like that? No. So would it be fair to say that when you go in there, you have the intention to either use force or intimidate by using the, or intimidate with the use of force? Yes, sir. Okay. And would it be a fair statement to say that you do this while you're armed? Yes, sir. Okay. And what would be the weapon that you would most likely use during a robbery of a drug dealer? A handgun. Okay. And what happens if you go in and you ask, you? well, let me ask you a question. Do you knock on the door or do you kick down the door? I knock on the door. You knock on the door? Yes. Okay. And when they open the door, what do you do? You give me everything. Okay. And... Do you set up surveillance before you do these robberies? No. No. Okay. So do you care whether or not if there's kids in the house when you're committing an armed robbery of a, of a, of a drug dealer? I do care if there's kids in the house. And when I do rob somebody, there's no kids in the house. But you just told me you don't do surveillance. So how do you know? Because there ain't going to be no kids in the house. I, I, we even know the guy we're going to rob. That's it. You know the guy that you're going to rob. Yeah. But yet you didn't do any surveillance, right? And, ain't no kids in the house. So you're telling me every time you hit a drug dealer, you knew whether or not that there were kids in the house because you have those moral standards? Yes, sir. I never hit nobody with no kids in no house. And you're saying that under oath to this jury? Yes, sir. And you understand what being under oath is, correct? Go ahead. Uh, explain to me. I mean, at the beginning, you raised your right hand. You swore to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, right? Yes, sir. Okay. And I'm sure as your lawyer has advised you, there is a penalty for lying under oath, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Have you ever lied under oath? No. That's not a proper question, Mr. Sanger. Well, let me ask you yeah. a question. Do you recall when you 
pled guilty in federal court, there was a document called a factual proffer. Do you recall that? Yeah, I heard. May I approach, Judge? May I approach, Your Honor? What purpose is it to show somebody who can't read the written document, Mr. Singer? Judge, it's got his initials on it. It has his signature. All right. It's got a date. Okay. Go ahead. Mr. Rivera, I'm showing you what's been marked as Defense Exhibit 2. But we already have a Defense Exhibit 2, unless we're going to do separate documents for Garcia. It's under Garcia, Judge. I apologize. It's been marked as Garcia number 2. Do you want me to change that, Your Honor? That'll be okay for now. We can discuss that later. Now, you indicated that you can't read, but you know what your name looks like, right? Of course. Whose name is that right there? My name. Is that your signature in the bottom right-hand corner? Yes, sir. I'm sorry, your initials? Yes, sir. On page 1. Are these your initials on page 2? Yes, sir. Are these your initials on page 3? Yes, sir. Are these your initials on page 4, sir? Yes, sir. And whose signature is that? Mine. And can you read numbers? Yeah. What number is that? 11-6-15. So on November 6, 2015, is that the day you gave your factual proffer? Yes. Are these the signatures? Is that your name? And these are the initials? Yes, sir. At this time, Judge, I'll move Defense Exhibit 2 under Garcia into evidence. Objection. Your side. For impeachment purposes. I'll sustain the objection at this point in time. I fail to see the relevance. But move on, Mr. Sangan. Do you recall me asking you if you had the crimes associated with your factual proffer on your record? Yes, sir. And you told me that even though it's on your record, that you didn't do some of these crimes. Is that correct? Yeah, I'll tell you that. You told me that, right? Yeah. And the document that I just showed you, did your lawyer, when he went over it with you, indicate that there's a portion that says, I agree with all the facts set forth in the factual proffer? Yes, sir. Okay. And also, when you took your plea of guilty in front of a federal judge, did he read this factual proffer to you? Yes, sir. Okay. Word for word, right? Not word for word, but he told me. He explained to me. Okay. And in both— Sustain the objection, Mr. Sangan. Let's move on. Which objection, Your Honor? I found it's not relevant. Move on. Give me just one second, Judge. Sure. Mr. Garcia, I'm sorry, Mr. Rivera, have you ever used your position as a leader in the Latin Kings to recruit other Latin Kings to help you further any violent crimes? Objection. Relevance. Overruled. 
Yes, you can sir. answer that. Well, I got a question for you. I'm here for another indictment. Well, Judge, with all, uh, sorry, Judge, the, could, I'm objecting to the to the witness asking questions of the attorney. Ask another question. So if you could answer that, the, the question that I just asked you. Ask, if you, ask your question again, please. Sure, no problem. Mr. Rivera, have you ever instilled the use of other Latin kings to further any kind of violent criminal act? Yes, sir. In fact, in the one month that your phone had a wire intercept, you attempted three separate violent acts reaching out to other fellow Latin kings. Isn't that correct? Objection, yes, relevance. Follow rule, please, Judge. So you can answer that question. Yes, sir. So on a 30-day period. You've asked it once. Thank you, you Judge. It yes, once. sir. We don't need to do it twice. No problem, Judge. Thank you. And in the future, if I refer to other fellow kings, is every fellow king have the word king prior to a nickname or a designation? Yes, sir. So the person that you were talking about earlier, Anthony, um, was it Rivera? Uh, Torres. Anthony Torres, did he have a king name? Hivaro. Hivaro. And is he still alive? He's dead, sir. Did he die here in South Florida? I was in prison when I found out. Um, do you know where he died? No. Uh, do you know how he died? I heard a motorcycle accident. And this is the individual that you're claiming you called to find my client when Katie called you, right? Yes, sir. Katie is Sigfredo's wife, as you described her, right? Yes, sir. She has his numbers, right? <coughs> yes, sir. You have his numbers, right? Yes, sir. And just for the record, Sigfredo had multiple phones at all times, correct? Yes, sir. All right. So let's get to... Let's get to June 4th, okay? Or let's actually, let's get to June 3rd. Do you remember what time Sigfredo came up to you and told you that he had a job for you in Tallahassee? Yeah, it was late night, maybe like about 10, 11 o'clock at night, somewhere around there. Okay, and what time did you guys hit the road? Excuse me? What time did you guys get on the road? Right away. Right away, okay. So, Let's just be, let's just go ahead and say around 11 o'clock. Does that sound about right? Maybe. I can't really remember the time, but I'm saying like between 9 to 11, it was out of the way. Okay. 9 to 11 p.m. Yes, sir. And this is when Sigfredo Garcia came to you with a rented, was it a Nissan? I think it was. Okay. But you didn't rent the car there that day, correct? Nope. And he came to you and he told you you had a job, right? Yes. Okay. And when did he tell you you had that job? In my house. Okay. And from there, and you went and you got a gun, right? I can't remember if it was the same day or not. Well, let me ask it this way. You had guns at your disposal, right? Yes, sir. Okay. You're a Latin king. You can call. Did you have your own personal firearm? No, I went and bought one. Let me let me see if I if I didn't ask that question correctly. Did you have your own piece? Did you have your own firearm for your own protection prior to the day? I always kept one. You always kept one. Yeah. Okay. So you had your own gun, right? Luis Rivera's gun, right? Yes, sir. But you choose not. You chose not to take that gun because you wanted to find another gun. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Because wouldn't that be a smarter thing to do, have a firearm if you're going to commit, whether it's a home invasion or a murder, that nobody knows is yours, right? Yes, sir. Okay. So, did you call one of your Latin King brothers to get a gun? No. Where'd you go? To the corner. To the corner, like in the hood? In the hood. Okay. 
And you, so you got a gun from a guy in the corner. White guy or black guy? Black, black guy. Black guy. So a black guy in the hood, you walked up to him and said, I need a piece, right? Yes, sir. Would it be safe to say, well, let me ask you this. In your Latin King Manifesto, does it talk about not involving non-Latin kings to ensure integrity within your organization? A way to put a murder case or put a Latin King case? I think it's the same thing. No, it's not. Okay, so answer my question. Don't answer my question with a question. It's not. What you talking about? You keep talking about the Latin Kings. It ain't got nothing to do with well, the murder. Well, hold on. But, the but murder. you're King Tato, right? Yeah, but it don't got nothing to do with the murder. According to you, right? Because if you were... Wait, if wait, you wait, were wait, wait a minute. Stop. Ask another question. Just saying it in. Uh, Ask the, answer the question. Is please. there a portion of the Latin King Manifesto which suggests that if you were to buy a, a gun to commit a crime, you'd buy it from another king to make sure you don't get in trouble? No. You can buy it from wherever you want to buy it from. You've been a leader of this organization since you were 15 years old, right? Yes, sir. Right. And so you understand, I mean, you're cooperating now, right? <laughs> yes, sir. Okay, so you understand there's informants and cooperators everywhere, right? Yes, sir. Correct? Yes, sir. Could be a stranger, could allegedly be your best friend, right? Yes, sir. So instead of calling one of your hundred gang member brothers, <laughs> where you are the king of the castle, the lion of the jungle, you choose to go to the hood and ask the stranger for a gun. That's your testimony? Yes, sir, because okay. they don't got nothing to do with what I'm, what I'm about to do. So you go, and you get this firearm. Does the gun come with bullets at least? No. You have to buy bullets separately? Yes, sir. All right. Kind of like a toy without batteries? Yeah, you can okay. say that. So did you go, where'd you go buy the bullets? <laughs> in a gun store. So you didn't ask the same guy on the corner to throw you some bullets in? No. Okay. So you go to the gun store, and do you buy a pack of bullets? Uh, single bullets. You buy, you buy, you buy single bullets? And is this regulated by the person that owns the firearm store? No. No? So you can just go buy bullets, you don't have to give ID or anything? Never gave my ID. And you bought a single bullet? No, we bought a few bullets. You bought three bullets? A few bullets. Like, fi I'm sorry. like 15 I, bullets. Are you going to give you the number correct? Well, it's kind of hard to hear you sometimes. So f 15 bullets? Yeah. Did you call Garcia and ask him if he needed some bullets too? Oh, he was with me. He was with you? Yeah. Do you know what time it was that you went to the... So Garcia was with you when you went to the hood? To what? get the gun? No. Okay. Which car did you use to go to the hood? My car. What kind of car is that? An uh, old Mercedes. An old Mercedes? Yeah. Okay. So you drive your own car to the hood... At this time, you already knew you needed you needed the, the the gun to commit this to commit whatever crime you thought was going that you were going to do, correct? Yes, sir. Okay, and you chose, and, and Garcia is right there with a the rental car, right? Right. When I bought the gun, right. When I, I mean, bought the gun, he was with a. Come on, come, come back, come back, come, come okay. back with me, man. After Garcia told you he had a job to do, how long after that did you go get the gun immediately? I can't remember. Okay. I think I told you that already. Well, I'm just trying to create a timeline. Yeah, but you're you going back and forth trying to confuse me. We're not going to do that. Just come on. I, I'm not trying to confuse I'm trying. I'm trying to ask a very simple question. He tells you you have a job, right? Right? Yeah. Okay. You assume this is a violent job, right? That's going to require you to get a firearm, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Now... You go from where you live. Are you living with, with Jessica at the time, or are you on your Miami Beach house? I live with Jessica. Okay. So you go, it's 135th Street? Yes, sir. So where'd you go? The pork and beans? Which hood did you go to? It's right around the corners. I live in the hood, man. Okay. So you go down the street in your car, right? Yes, sir. And you buy a fire. Yes, sir. And then you come back and get in the car with Garcia, and then you go buy bullets? Now you confused me right there, though. 
think I'm with Garcia in the car. Okay. I can't remember. I okay. can't remember. Okay. Now you can. Okay. So after you get the bullets, do you guys head up north? We got the bullets the next day, man. Okay. Let me refresh my memory. You're going back and forth. No, listen, take your time. Take your time. <laughs> we got nothing but time. We got 19 years. Can't take that long. That's the thing. <laughs> That's a good question. Come on. You got a citation on June 4th in the morning, right? The prosecution showed you? Yeah. Okay. Did you get the gun on June 3rd or June 2nd? I already had the gun going up there. That wasn't my question, sir. My question is, after Mr. Garcia allegedly told you about this purported job, you said that you went to get a gun, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Did he tell you about this job the night of or the day before you left going north? No, the same night he told me about it. Okay. The same night. So you went down the corner, got the gun, and then got your bullets, and then headed up north, right? Yes, sir. You testified originally on direct, direct examination that he drove, right? Yes, sir. And then the prosecutor showed you a ticket, and then you said, well, we had to switch out, right? Yes, sir. Is it your testimony? Well, let me ask you this. Was, were you and Garcia drinking on your way up north? Every time. Every time, okay. That's not in Coke. Okay, well, that's what I'm getting to. And you and Garcia were drinking and driving, right? Yes, sir. Snorting cocaine? Yes, sir. Who was snorting mo more Coke? You or Sigfredo? Sigfredo. I'm sorry, Mr. Garcia. I apologize, sir. Mr. Garcia, who is doing more coke, you or him? Him. Okay. Like a little bit or a lot more? <laughs> Just a, a lot Not A little bit more. A little bit more. How much cocaine did you and Mr. Garcia go through from Miami to Gainesville? Can't remember. And a, a gram? I can't remember. Two grams? I can't remember, sir. How much did you take up there? I don't remember. About an eight ball sound right? Maybe a little bit more, probably. Okay. So a little bit more than an eight ball is how many grams? 3.5. Uh, so 3.5 is one eight ball, so you took a little bit more. So let's say, would about five grams sound about right? Probably. So it's your testimony that as an experienced gang member, you get in a rental car, Sounds like we're about to repeat what's been said. Just saying, hey, we're not going to keep repeating everything twice. Let's move on, please. Okay. In your in, in the car that you were driving, you had been drinking alcohol. There were little alcohol bottles. Yes, sir. Okay. When you got pulled over by the police, you were driving, right? Obviously, you got the ticket, right? Yes, sir. Did you check to see if you had any? Remnants of cocaine powder on your nose? Not at all. What about uh, Mr. Garcia? Did you look to see if he had any remnants of co cocaine on his nose? No. And in the car are two firearms? Yes, sir. I don't remember what number exhibit this is. This is mine? Uh, this is, I was going to introduce it, but you introduced it before me. Yes, sir. The location on your driver. I think this will be better. Sorry, Judge. 
The location on your driver's license as your address is 1805 Normandy Drive, apartment three. Is that correct? Yes, sir. That's in Miami Beach, Florida. Is that correct? Yes, sir. How long have you lived in Miami Beach? My whole life. You're born April 25th, 1983? Yes, sir. You're a Hispanic male and you're five foot four? Yes, sir. And the citation is going 90 miles an hour in a 70 mile an hour zone, correct? Yes, sir. So in conjunction to all the things that I've already described, the firearms, the drugs, the empty bottles, you were going 90 miles an hour at 9 o'clock in the morning, correct? Yes, sir. Now, the officer that pulled you over was a Florida, was it a Florida, it was a FHP, Florida Highway Patrol? I think so. At any point, did he ask you to exit the vehicle to determine if he needed to conduct field sobriety <coughs> exercises? No, sir. Did you smoke any marijuana in the car? No, sir. Did you take any marijuana with you? No, sir. So it's you and, you and Mr. Garcia in a rental car with all the contraband we, we discussed and Trooper Downing just issues you a citation for speeding, correct? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, that citation took place He's telling me where to go. I don't even know where I was at. And who's he? Garcia. Garcia. Did he have his GPS on his phone? Uh, in his brain. In his brain. Had you ever been up to Tallahassee with, with Mr. Garcia before? Never in my life. And it was your testimony earlier that Mr. Garcia never utilized his cell phone GPS, is that correct? No. And as you indicated to the members of this jury, he was right next to you. If he was using his phone, you would have been able to see that he was using his phone for GPS, correct? Yes, sir. And he was able to get you not only from Miami, Florida to, to Tallahassee, but to drive around in Tallahassee to the appropriate locations, is that correct? Yes, sir. Do you know roughly how far mile, mark, mile marker 374 is? from Gainesville to Tallahassee? No idea. After you received this citation, who drove? Did you continue driving? Yes, sir. And so from at least Gainesville, to Tallahassee, you drove the rest of the way? Yes, sir. Did you guys still have the alcohol bottles in, in, the, in the Nissan after you got pulled over? Yeah, it was in a brown paper bag. Brown paper bag. You didn't think to throw it out afterwards? No, it didn't even cross my mind. How many drinks would you say that you had consumed? I can't remember that. Was it one? I can't remember that, sir. Was it two? Move on, Mr. Sink. Yeah. What about Mr. Garcia? Were you watching how many alcoholic beverages he was consuming? Not at all. How many alcoholic beverages, how many little bottles did you guys buy? Bought a bunch. I just can't remember how many. Give me a rough estimate of what I a bunch. I can't remember how many, sir. Multiple? That means more than, more than two? Uh, of course, it's more than two, but I can't remember how many. And do you remember how long it took to drive from Miami to Gainesville? 
I don't know, it took a couple of hours. I mean, a bunch of hours, I don't remember though. And during that time, did you guys consume all the alcohol of beverages that you had from Miami to Gainesville? Or did you have more alcohol after you got pulled over? No, I think we had drank them all already. So when you get to Tallahassee, and you're still driving, right? Yes, sir. Where do you go on, on June 4th, the same day of the citation? We went straight to the hotel. Okay. We, went to, we went to go rent a hotel that day. You went to rent a hotel. Okay. And did you pick the hotel, or did Mr. Garcia pick the hotel? Garcia picked the hotel. Do you remember which exit you guys took off the highway? No, sir. You were driving though, right? Yes, sir. And how much of the cocaine did you have left? Do you remember? No, I can't remember. You think you had burned through most of it? Probably. And would it be a fair assessment to say that you hadn't slept all night? Yeah, I didn't sleep. Okay. And the night before, you didn't know that this was going to be uh, occurring, right? You found out that's that, right? Yes, sir. Okay. So, you had been up all day and all night? And right. You Correct. And you consumed multiple alcoholic beverages, correct? Yes, sir. And you and Mr. Garcia had consumed multiple grams of cocaine, is that correct? Yes, sir. So, it's also your testimony that somewhere after Orlando, that Mr. Garcia, according to you, tells you that this is a homicide. Right? Is that first trip or the second trip? First trip. Okay. Right? Yes, sir. That's when you find out it's a, it's a homicide. I just want to make sure, sir. Okay. And it's your testimony to these jurors that he told you that he's going to give you either 30 or 35 stacks, right? Yes, sir. It's also been your testimony to this jury that you believed that he thought that you were going to do the shooting, right? Yes, sir. And just for the record, your testimony is that you did not do the shooting, correct? Yes, sir. Did you still receive the same amount of money? Yes, sir. So for not committing the act that you were hired to do, right? Because it's your testimony that Secreto Garcia, Mr. Garcia, hired you to commit this murder, not to be your tag along, that he still paid you the amount of money that he told you that he'd pay you at the beginning, right? Yes, sir. Okay. So he didn't tell you, hey, listen, I thought you were going to actually do the murder, and I had to do it, so I'm going to give you, a man, I'll give you 10 stacks for two rides, right? Yeah. So you got $35,000 for two rides from Miami to Tallahassee, yes, right? Sir. Right? Yes, sir. Can you find a good stopping point? I can stop right now. I think the jury probably had enough for the death. Yes, Judge. What? I mean, I wouldn't say it's not right this moment. Uh, absolutely. If you point. think the jury's done for the day, we'll, we'll pick back up tomorrow. My pleasure. So it's a decent. That's That's fine. Point. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, I think we'll probably reach a point where things are uh, hard to keep your concentration. Don't discuss the case with anyone. Don't let anyone discuss the case with you. Uh, 845 tomorrow. Yes, we probably know the drill pretty well by now. Uh, We'll see you all in the morning. Same time every day, 8.30. Just checking, just want to make All sure. Right. Um, we need to resolve the discussion.